Happy Saturday noon, everybody. Uh, afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Rotowire Fantasy Baseball Podcast. Coming at you a little different this week. Uh, we're going to be breaking down the high stakes five thousand dollar entry NFBC Ultimate Draft today. Uh, all coming up next on the Rotowire Fantasy Baseball Podcast. Hey, everybody, welcome to the uh, Rotowire Fantasy Baseball Podcast. Like I said in the intro here, we're going to actually be uh, doing something a little different today. We're, uh, it's uh, kind of kicking off high stakes draft season. We got a lot of drafts in Vegas next week. Everybody doing NFBC main events, everybody's doing uh, our online championships. Uh, so we're going to talk about a specific draft today. It's a $5,000 entry. Uh, the, the Mike the Mouth Ultimate, uh, he puts it, Mike Masato puts it together. Uh, everybody's live in New York. We're going to jump to uh, Mike and the guy who's won this league three years in a row in a second. But first of all, uh, I got a special co-host today, breaking it down. Nobody better do this. He's wearing two AL Central uh, things going on right now. He's got a White Sox jersey and a Twins hat. So I don't know how we're going to deal with this exactly. But uh, everybody knows him. Uh, he's one of the better uh, high stakes players, one of the better fantasy players, a really good analyst also, really good guy too. Uh, Toby, bat flip crazy. How's everything going? Uh, things are great, Scott. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate uh, coming back on. You know, a lot of people grew up rooting for different teams, and I just grew up rooting, <laughs> rooting for divisions. You know, everybody's you always go. picking on the AL Central, <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I'm going to go for it. You know, my seven-year-old picked out my hat for me, and I already had the White Sox uh, Robin Ventura jersey on. So Beautiful. So as I mentioned before, we're going to kind of break down this draft. It's a uh, $5,000 entry, uh, Ultimate uh, Online. The, one of the nice things is, uh, all the people in the draft have agreed for their names to be uh, affiliated with the board. I don't know if you read Twitter at all, Toby. There's been a, lot, a little bit of uh, interest in that names being uh, mentioned on boards, uh, ADP, all that kind of stuff, big stickers. Uh, everybody's going uh, full uh, full open here. Uh, we're going to see who's picking who. Uh, so it's uh, it's going to be fun because uh, there's no uh, no hiding names on this in this draft. Yeah, uh, respect to people for, uh, for putting that out there. I know people put a lot of time, energy, and effort into their research. So right. sometimes people are protective of, of, of putting that information out there. You know, for there's sure. actually a couple of people in here who, who I'm in leagues with later on. So I'll be spaying, paying uh, Very nice. extra attention to that. Very nice. Um, so we actually, uh, the draft starts in about 11 minutes here. I'm actually going to have uh, Mike Masada, who uh, kind of organizes and runs this thing, as well as the three-time defending champion, Scott Fleming. For doing the math there, that's $120,000 in winnings just in this league the last three years. Kind of a bonkers number, $40,000 the entry. I'm going to bring them in right now. Uh, we're talking about the draft a little bit uh, before they get going. I know they just did their live. They do a live KDS for picks, so you don't know what pick you're getting when you show up. Um, so it's a live KDS. Your name comes up. You pick what uh, what order you want, and you go from there. Uh, our friend Rob D. Pietro, I've always, I already see, gets, has the number one pick. So uh, Rob's having a good afternoon. But let me uh, let me have these guys uh, jump in, and uh, we'll uh, we'll chat to them a little bit before the draft starts here. Mike Scott, how are you guys? What's up there, guys? Hi guys. It's about time. Where I was happy this year. We're gonna have some professional covers for a change. And then you told me Toby was doing it with you, so that that kind of brought it down. <laughs> nice. But, uh, uh, that 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 fits perfectly because we've been saying how great Scott is, and we have not been saying as good things about you. So it, it kind of works perfectly. Yeah, I heard it was great. It was great stuff. And then and then, and then the funny thing is, yeah, Toby uh, found a way to get into the main event that we're doing on Sunday together. So he wanted to make sure that we're in the main event together. So just for that, I'm going to make it my CLQ just to rub it in your face, Toby. Just so you for know sure. That. Uh, for sure. Well, you know, anytime Mike Masato is in a draft, you know, I'm going to be in that draft too, right? Perfect. You got to take we're sitting right next to each other. It. I hope we're sitting right next to each other. Uh, that's why it'll be, probably be perfect. Yeah. So okay. Mike, you organize, you organize this draft, really cool setup. You have, everybody's there in person. Everybody's, uh, everybody's, uh, you know, doing the draft. You guys just did the live KDS. I mentioned, uh, give us a, a 90 second intro on how the league is, what the entry fee is, what the prizes are, all that kind of stuff. Who's in this? Uh, just break it down for me because this is, a, this is a pretty cool league. Yeah, it's like it's like it's really like I, I call it the premier league, the NFBC. I really want to do like a really big home league feel, high stakes home league feel. We have an amazing trophy, which we awarded uh, to Scott before we started. It's the travel trophy. You get your name on the plaque. It's gorgeous. Goes around. We got that. We have uh, the laser engraved baseballs with your names on them to go into the bucket. And we have a celebrity draft facilitator every year. And it's been Adam Ronis for many years doing. He nice. did it again this year. Pulls the balls. It's really cool because cool you don't know what you're going to get. You get a jockey and uh, pick uh, spots. I ended up at nine this year. And uh, obviously, Di Pietro is sleeping with people we don't know. And uh, <laughs> we're the number one pick uh, here and to do that. But, uh, yeah, so we have that's that, that feature of it, uh, which is really cool. We have a big party afterwards. It's just all, it's all a fun. It's always live, 100% as requirement. You got to be here live. We, have, we had several people fly in for this draft, just for this draft here on the East Coast. So, this is our 13th year. 
uh, traditionally started with a ton of like Hall of Famers, high star, high stakes people in it. And we, it's only, it's only, it's always tough, tough competition. And, and, and yes, for all the ball busting you want to give me, I have won the league twice. Okay. Over the years. So I, I did manage to pull that off uh, and, nice. not, and not always, finish, and not always finish in last place. Okay. So just so you know that. Well, but, let, uh, let's talk to the, uh, let's talk to the real star of this draft. Scott Fleming, who's sitting next to you has won this league three years in a row, which is pretty crazy for a 15 team or no matter any level of competition. That is really impressive. Uh, Scott, tell us about your wins. Are you, are you kind of same strategy? Is this league uh, easier than we think it is? Like what, what's the, what's the, uh, what's the, uh, what's the method here? No, I've just been fortunate. I got lucky uh, a couple times. I caught breaks towards the end of the season. Actually, all three of my wins, I had someone that could have passed me any day at the end of the season. So it just broke right at the end, and I held on. Usually I come out okay and then sort of hold on for dear life later. And uh, that's been the, the route all three years. I see. I see. You're picking 15. When did your uh, When did your name come up? Was that uh, Is that a choice, or did you get the Were you 15th yeah, out of the bucket? Adam Adam didn't find the envelope I left for him this year. So uh, I, uh, you got you got you got to put that envelope getting... in the freezer before the before the. Before yeah, the yeah. Game. I was I was the 14th ball out this year. Well, he was anybody... the number one ball out last year. He was the number one ball last year. He got a cunha, so uh, gifted that, to him. So that, that worked yeah, no, well. I've, I've been fortunate enough. I'm okay. Was there anything in the KDS uh, that was surprised you guys? It was a pretty much uh, kind of whoever came out took the took the earliest pick. Was there any any big, any big surprise in the KDS? Not much. No, there was actually a lot less moving around this year than in years past. How do you guys feel about that? I know as you're setting KDS for main events, where do you guys kind of come out and uh, where you want to be picking? Is it uh, it's kind of straight butter? Yeah, straight butter for me. I'm leaving it one through, you know. But uh, but then again, the, the wonderful algorithms, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm somehow ending up with the same pick. <laughs> Kind of you know, multiple times <laughs> over, so and 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 uh, got an eight pick in the twenty five, eight pick and a, a five thousand tomorrow, and a nine pick tonight. But in, even though that wasn't the computer generated, so I'm, I'm destined to be in the middle. It looks like this year, although I had all my front end picks last year. Sink or swim. Most, sink uh, swim. Most importantly, where's the post game party? Post game party is going to be at the MCM Estates. Oh, fancy! Here. Oh, so you're going to have everybody over. Yeah, and the, uh, and Mike's got a ten thousand square foot home down the block. So eleven thousand. Got the wow. pool open early. We're 11, ready to go. Eleven thousand. <laughs> we're going to we're going to take Ein, we're going to take Einhorn's helicopter over. <laughs> it's all over, and we're going to head Beautiful. over there, and uh, this is going to be good. But uh, yeah, it's going to be great. We have you know an awesome setup there. It's going to be a great time partying into the night, and uh, good times. So we'll hang out afterwards and. Look at we look at the draft boards. Talk shit. Excuse me, I, I shouldn't have swore. I'm not supposed to swear. I, I even sent you a text message about that. You like sent me a text. Ago. I said I wouldn't. And it's I'm, been, I'm in it's Jersey, been less so than please, ten minutes since I sent you that. Bleed me out, wrote a wire. You know, if that's the worst swear that comes out of my mouth from Jersey. You're lucky at this point. You know, that is and even good. saying my my Rick, I'm wearing my just like Toby wears his jersey. I'm wearing my Rick Wild Thing Vaughn readers uh, today for the draft okay. over here. So they have to see them. Uh, I do love that. That that is that is beautiful. Yeah. That is that's perfect. Right, so, sorry. anything else? Uh, anything else you guys want to mention before I let you? Obviously, you got five minutes of the draft. I don't want to take up your guys' time as you kind of get uh, figures everything out. Uh, anything else you guys want to say before uh, before we start drafting? No, I assume I'll finish last this year, so I'm okay with it. I'm ready to go. <laughs> yeah, you've got some you've got some uh, goodwill uh, built up there. You can have a couple. You can have a couple bad years in a row and still be good. But um, thank you. Thank yeah, you. no, three years, three years in a row winning any league. Like if you win any main event league three years in a row, that's pretty good. Winning this league three years yeah. in a row at five grand a pop. What's the uh, what's the prize? Is forty grand for first? What how's the breakout after that? Twenty twenty for second and seventy five hundred for third. And standard it's a standalone league. There's no overall components, so you're gonna see some different strategies probably right. um, to go along. It's a little different than the main event. So uh, in that way, but again, just a great bunch of people, great bunch of veterans here, and they all loving and having a passion for the same thing we all love. And nothing like doing it in person. And, and and thanks for Greg and everybody for making it happen. And we're looking forward to seeing you guys out in Vegas. I know you guys will do a killer job, you know, and uh, we'll go from there. But we'll so we hopefully maybe talk to some other people on breaks. Yeah, and, if you guys, uh, uh, you as, as, we, as we do some breaks, if you got some interesting builds going, we'll definitely have you guys uh, have someone jump on that's uh, then doing some drafts. So, yeah, look forward to seeing both you guys in Vegas uh, next week. Kind of crazy that it's already next week. It's uh, it's flying up. And look uh, look forward to seeing you guys. And uh, good luck in the, in this big draft here. All right. All right, thanks, guys. guys. Thanks a lot, man. Right, Take care. Yep. So Toby, uh, talk to me about uh, talk to me about pre-draft. Uh, you know, as we get uh, they got about five minutes of this draft starts. What do you what do you bring into the table? I feel like you're just like your one computer guy in your spreadsheet. What uh, what do you bring to the table? Because I feel like we're pretty different in how we draft. Yeah, I, I'm generally I generally have my computer, so I have a I'm a spreadsheet uh, I'm a spreadsheet guy. So I have my spreadsheet on my computer. I normally don't print anything out. Uh, with the exception of when I do auctions, I do um, 
I do like to have some paper that I can cross off. So like physically cross off names and things like that. And then within my spreadsheet, I just have my values, ADP. Um, I'll have, um, in some instances, I'll have auction values or AAVs in there as well. And so just kind of looking at that, I'll also have probably a pre-built team in there. So I like to kind of build out and see how my teams are going. Um, and then if things diverge, then I'll change it up. But I always like to play it out a few times ahead of time just to make sure I know where I'm going to pivot in different instances. In a, in a draft, how close do your teams come out to being your pre, pre bland teams? I feel like a draft so much changes. Yeah, it really does. I mean, more, more so than like the actual players is more the types of players, you know, and like kind of the, right. whether it's the position or um, the way that the stats line up. Um, it just gives me an opportunity to say, okay, like if I'm starting with this base, players similar to this, you know, I'm feeling confident in my ability to build a balanced team, build a team that's close to the category totals I want by the end. And then I'm always, I think one of the things I used to be a bit more rigid in doing that, but I think I've opened myself up more to kind of pivoting where value might be or um, giving myself some flexibility within the draft. Yeah, I think that's that. That's really key. I'm uh I'm a little more kind of feel and I, I do print stuff out and I kind of just kind of bold my names and I don't do my own projections. I kind of, you know, I obviously look at other people's stuff and look at some, look at some stuff that's out there, but I don't do my own projections. I know you guys are, uh, you know, really good with that kind of stuff. I'm not the best with that, but um, you know, I kind of have my guys bolded and it's, it's more of a little bit of a feel for me. I kind of know who I like and who I want to like. And I think I imagine with you, it's like when you kind of pre-build out that team, like round 15 to 30, there's probably a lot of guys you do end up with because you know who you like in the back half of the draft. There's a there's a lot less of that, like, well, this guy slipped or this guy got taken or someone jumped this guy in the later rounds. Like, you kind of know who you want and you can kind of get your guys. Whereas in the first, like, you know, eight rounds, it does, it, it does, it does matter what other people take in terms of getting your guys. Yeah, definitely. I think a lot of times it's just the mental exercise of going through that, you yeah. know, and walking through it and then seeing how, you know, how, yeah, when the guys that you get towards the back end, what does that leave you with needing earlier on in the draft? So I think you're precisely right. And obviously there's many, many different ways to do this. And you've been incredibly successful um, with your approach. So if something's working for you, I would definitely not suggest shifting <laughs> too much. Yeah, I'd like I'd like another couple of weeks to get ready for drafts, but I don't think anybody's going to give those to me. But other than that, uh, yeah, I mean, it's been... Uh, it's been fun. It's been a good ride. It's always, these drafts are always really fun. I mean, I, I know we always talk about, uh, you know, Vegas and, and live drafts, but we're, I think we have nine main events going Saturday morning, something like that all at once in the same big room. Like it's a weird, like people always ask me, like, is it harder to draft, you know, live or in person? I think it's a lot harder to draft live. I just think that saying names out loud, like there's just some, you have to take some ownership in that. It sounds really weird. And we're talking about fantasy baseball draft. Is it like, but like, if you want to, if you're going to kind of reach out for somebody, you got to say it out loud. People are going to look at you if you, uh, you know, if it's a weird pick or a bad pick or something happens or, you know, you're the rogue draft and you're shuffling through, uh, shuffling through magazines in round 16. But, um, it just, you just don't have the comfort of being home. Like you can look up an injury really quick or, you know, someone could bring you food or bring you like, it's just, I think it, the live drafts are so, so fun, but there, there's a, there's a level of uh, difficulty in it. They're just not built into an online draft. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm actually, I've only, this is the second year in a row that I'm only doing one main and I decided this year not to do the Saturday, the Saturday oh, you're not, morning. Oh, I, I just, I just pumped it up and you're not drafting it. No, no, no. I mean, I, I agree. Like it's a ton of fun. It's super enjoyable. But it is more difficult, I think. And I think it's challenging with like, especially towards the back end of drafts, you hear people shouting out names. You can sometimes recognize who the people are that are shouting out the names. I remember a couple instances where people have like made draft picks. And because it was a particular person making that draft pick, the next person who couldn't right. figure out who they were going to go with went that direction. And I'd prefer to give myself the best shot with the Champions League qualifiers happening as well. I just want to give myself the best chance to be successful well we've got off the bat the draft just started we have a holy crap moment uh rob di pietro did not take uh ronald acuna at one uh i assume he won the kds and got pick one uh went spencer strider at the first pick kind of uh kind of wild toby what do you think about that yeah um i i mean it's obviously a bold move i think with acuna the challenge with him is just the injury right like we've seen him yeah suffer injuries before we've seen him have the the knee issue obviously he's already back i don't know if he's stolen any bases yet since he's been back but so much of that value is tied up in the steals and early on in the draft you want to avoid risk so my guess would be that would be kind of the approach um that rob is taking there as well but um yeah i think that's that's the way 
Would you have uh, would you have picked uh, spot one if you wanted Spencer Strider? What would you? I mean, I guess it's just it's spot two. We see it's funny with the, we, as we did this, the main event ADP came out of the first five main events. Strider is the the second pick. Well, there's a lot, been a lot of Bobby Witt, Lottie Julio Rodriguez, pretty much you know, the entire draft season uh, in main event draft so far. Spencer Strider is second off the board uh, at ADP. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I think I think it's one of those things where I debate this as well, but. Let's say you want Strider and you think there's a 95% chance that you're yeah. going to get Strider. Is it worth taking that 5% shot that you don't get the player that you want there? Or do you do you wait? Um, I think you can go either way. Rob obviously wanted the guy that he wanted and yeah. and and went there. So and the that that two percent chance, maybe uh, you know, the difference between picks 29 or whatever it is, 29 and 32 versus 30 and 31, probably not the big difference if you really know you want your guy. Yeah, absolutely. And I think some people are more comfortable, you know, in that two or that 14 spot than they are on the turn. Um, it's a position that I kind of like to be at just because you can see or or think about who the guy later on in the draft might want to go. So let's say you're going for your second catcher and you can look over and say, OK, this guy's already got two catchers. Right. I can I, I can skip a catcher and go with this guy this time. So. I think that there's there's people who like being in different spots and 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 so yeah that that might impact it too. And that's a really good little tidbit. I, I do that if I'm at pick two, three, or like 13, 14. I always am looking at those other two teams. You're you never really know what someone's gonna do, but you have a pretty good feel if someone you know needs a pitcher or needs a catcher, like you said. It's uh it's an interesting little strategy there where you you kind of can sort of predict those next three or you know, either two or four picks and kind of kind of work yourself that way. Yeah, I mean, you know, even in one of my um, DCs, and I'm sorry to mention DCs, Scott. I know you. Yeah, I forced I you to, a, to do one. I have, with I have the shakes right now for my current DC going on. Uh, yeah, totally. I mean, I mean, I remember being even in the twelfth round and being like, okay, I'm in pick. I think I was pick eleven or twelve, and I was thinking, do I want to go second baseman or do I want to go in a different position? And I actually looked, and everybody had second base and at least one shortstop taken some two. Oh, nice. And so I was yeah. like, Oh, okay. So even MI is taken up a little bit here with yeah. some of these early picks. So I feel pretty confident that I can wait and get Cattell Marte or whoever it was a little bit later. Cattell Marte. It's almost like you listened to my targets and fade podcast. That was pretty good. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, um, yeah, who, you, how can you not like Cattell Marte, right? <laughs> yeah, I love it. Uh, so we're in the first round here, almost at the end. Uh, Trey Turner just went 14th to uh, our, our friend Daniel Preppus, who we know. Um, is there anybody in the first round, Toby, that you find yourself not wanting to draft this year? It's one of those weird years. Usually I have two or three guys. And I'm like, I don't really want that in the first round. Uh, I'm not sure I have one this year. I think this first round is pretty darn stacked. Yeah, I think the first round is pretty solid. You know, Corbin Carroll, a little bit of concern around the shoulder injury, just given the injury history, but he's obviously – really good. So I think if he were to drop a little bit more, I might go in that direction. Um, I think the only question, you know, and again, like, you know, we've, we've got to talk about something, right? Uh, you know, Jordan Alvarez, I really, I love him. You know, yeah. I love him. I love him. But if you look at his plate appearances, the last five seasons, I think he's maxed out around, around 500 plate appearances. And so the question becomes, okay, if you're going to project him for around 500, you know, is replacement value on top of what he provides you enough? And I think in a lot of ways it is, but that's just one debate that I've had and I haven't found myself being able to really, um, you know, pu uh, press the button, you know, when it came to uh, to Jordan Alvar Alvarez early on. Yeah, that's a, that's a fair point. You just, with, with these, these speed power guys in the first round, like there's so many guys that have to do both of it, both of them. With Jordan, you just know you're getting no steals. And, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, kind of judge is probably in that range there too, with the, especially with the foot, you know, already said he's maintaining the foot for the rest of his career. I imagine we're not stealing a lot of bases, but uh, end of the first round, uh, three-time champion Scott Fleming went with Zach Wheeler as the, uh, as uh, at the 15th pick end of the first round. Uh, is Zach Wheeler your second uh, starter? How do you feel about uh, these, these kind of top end of the board? Cause we're losing a lot of them. Yuri Perez uh, went to, was going from imaging today. Garrett Cole obviously is uh, out uh, 10 to 12 weeks. The last thing we heard um, there are, there are a number of pitchers coming off, uh, off the, uh, the top, you know, I guess I call it the top 20 pitchers. That sort of thing. We want to get Yuri in there. Uh, where do you kind of feel with these top three or four pitchers? Uh, is, is Wheeler your second? Is Burns your second? Uh, where do you fall on these guys at the moment? Yeah, I'd probably, I'd probably go Wheeler. Um, I think, you know, and we got to give the benefit of the doubt to uh, Scott, who has those three straight championships. So yep. uh, you can't go wrong there. Um, so yeah, I, I do think that pitching is a, a challenge. There's, this is that's an interesting one right there. Pablo Lopez, yep, um, going as SP four, I think early on um, yep. to Mike Major. Or am I am I allowed? 
yeah, I can, I can, I can, I can say who the names of people. Names, right? uh, names open. are open here. Uh, okay. our, uh, our host, Mike Masato has confirmed that everybody's name can be up on the board. Okay, great. Um, yeah. So, so that's interesting. I think, yeah, I, I, I like the, the Wheeler pick right there. It's been very interesting to see. Um, yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see what pitchers do. I think each draft is going to be very, very different. Like some of the times you'll see a lot of those pitchers move up into the second round. Um, but there's so many good hitters in that spot too. So it's, it's going to be interesting. How do you feel about those guys? Uh, yeah, I, I think I probably, uh, I really like Zach Wheeler. And I think that my, my dreams of him, like middle to late second round is probably long gone in the main event. I, it's funny how every year we know pitchers, these, these, these studs starting pitchers are going to get pushed up. And then every, every year I'm like, oh, I guess I'm not getting Wheeler where I thought he was. He is ADP in the first main event. First five main events is 18.2. So that's like the third pick of the, of the second round. Um, I am probably going two hitters if I have a spot in the back end of this first round, to be honest with you. I think that, uh, I just love the hitting in the first three rounds. I love the pitching kind of in rounds three through seven. So I think, uh, I think that that kind of moves up in the, in the main and the 15 teams I've been looking at, like pitchers like four through eight, I kind of moved everybody up around just because the, the main events are crazy with pitchers. We got a couple guys that are out um, along those lines. We had a question from our good friend, Derek Van Riper, kind of right at you, uh, Toby, because it's a pocket aces question. Uh, are you thinking uh, ace plus a big bat at 15, 16 pocket aces or ace plus a, uh, like a speed power guy. Like if you're at the back end uh, if you happen to get a 14, 15 pick, what's kind of your plan there? Are you, do you want one of those pitchers? At least you have an edge on everybody else. Are you going two hitters? What, what are you doing at the back end there? Yeah, I really think it depends on who's available. Um, you know, with, uh, with Scott's approach there, like I, I do like Wheeler. Um, so if he's available, I may go a pitcher in that instance. I've actually had, I think I've picked, what have I picked? 11 and 12 and 15 teamers so far in my two DCs that I've done. Um, and in both of those instances, I started off uh, hitter, hitter actually, yeah. because I really do think that there's some nice, some really nice couplings on the, on the back end there. Um, and so I think if you can create that really solid balance, and like you said, there are some, uh, some pitchers that I really like in rounds three through seven. So if I don't have a pitcher, I don't love the pitchers that are falling to the, to round three all that much, but I do like some of them who are going afterwards. So yeah, it's just a matter of pick your, pick your, I don't know the opposite of poison, but uh, pick whatever you want to do yeah pick your sweetener pick your so i don't know what that there is. you go um so uh first uh first pick that sticks out uh you know we, we there's a lot of ellie de la cruz talk uh this off season some people love the guy some people think he's massively overdrafted there's a lot of strong opinions on ellie de cruz obviously a really really fun player uh mike masato who we spoke to earlier just put him at pick what is that uh pick 22 so uh second pick uh in the in the in the second or uh, was that six pick in the second round, seven pick, second round, something like that. Where are you on Dela Cruz? Obviously, the upside is uh, unlimited, but uh, you know, a lot of strikeouts, a lot of issues. Second year in the league here. Uh, where are you at Ellie Dela Cruz as a second round pick? Yeah, um, he's actually the 21st player on the board, off the board on average in the first five main events. So he's one of the guys who's getting pushed up there. Uh, I, I think and the, I, funny because I kind of thought that would be the opposite. And it hit, I thought, like, ah, we went to main events, pitches will go up, maybe Ellie will go to two, three turn. It has not happened at all. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I think the injury, um, uh, uh, or not the injury, but the, the suspension to Noel V. Marte, you know, yeah. I think solidified playing time. Um, for me, you know, when I look at his projection the plate appearances are pretty low, but when I update that to like 615, he's still not a bargain for me on my spreadsheet. But I think when you have a player, who you feel pretty confident is going to give you power, decent amount of power at least, and a lot of steals um, in the ballpark that he's in. And then you factor in the potential for um, developmental growth and a guy who's really been successful at every stop throughout the minors at a very young age. Um, I think people see a lot of potential in him, what he might be able to do. And I think Mike, you know, um, it's always sad to give him you know, a little credit, but, you know, partnering him with Soto, who's got that high batting average that yep. you can couple with De La Cruz, who's, who's really, you know, as long as he's healthy, you know, is going to put up some really good numbers. It, it gives you a little bit of a cushion there. So um, I don't mind the pick there. It's not necessarily a direction that I would go, but I can definitely see it. Yeah. Every time I look at him, I just see the 34% strikeout rate. And I just, I, it's hard for me to click it in the second round with, you know, ahead of guys like, and you look at someone like Michael Harris moving up a lot. He went in the, uh, in the middle of the second round here to Jody Ryan, uh, but you got Lindor, like Devers, Vlad Guerrero. I just think I'm taking one of those hitters over Dela Cruz. I, 
I fully admit that uh, maybe I'm just wrong. Maybe he just goes crazy. Maybe it's a, you know, a, a 25, 50 kind of thing, which is certainly possible. Um, you know, he was what, 13, 35 and 98 games last year, but man, that strikeout rate freaks me out a lot. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's definitely, um, it's, it's definitely a risky pick. And I agree with you that sometimes early on in drafts, you want to be play it a little bit safer. So uh, team two is an interesting build through three rounds. It's a uh, Jason Santio Santio. I don't know if I pronounced that right. I probably butchered it. Uh, he got Acuna at the second pick, which obviously a uh, massive windfall. You don't expect that. You're like, you kind of have to like re jigger what you're going to do. You're like, oh, I don't, didn't expect that. He went Acuna and then two pitchers, uh, two pitchers that are fascinating cases. Both of them uh, in the second round, he took Tyler glass now, which obviously, um, you know, massive upside, but has never pitched more than 120 innings in the majors and going to the Dodgers, Obviously, a great setting for everything. Offense, good, good place to pitch. Uh, well coached. Everything works out really well. Uh, going to going to LA, and then he took uh, Tarek Skubal in the uh, I guess pick three point two. So two starters that are you know not guys we saw in the second and third round a year ago. Uh, Glasnow, obviously, we just don't know. He's really really good when he pitches. Uh, talk to you about uh, Glasnow and Skubal. Where are you in both those guys? Those are really popular names, and uh, you know. Kind of like Dela Cruz, a little bit more on the polarizing side. There are people that that like and dislike both those guys. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's um, I think there are different approaches to pitching, and, and and you know, I'm like trying to formulate the best way to say this, but with like a glass now and school school combo right there, I think it's really hard to project them for a ton of innings. Yeah, but if you can say, all right, let's say that they each get to 140. You know, um, which, you know, again, for Scooble, you know, maybe I can I, I can see that it's tough with glass now, given the injury history. You know, you're getting 280 innings and then your assumption is that the ratios are going to be really strong. So you give yourself that base of really solid ratios with glass now pitching in with the Dodgers, you know, the, the wins that he'll get maybe increase a little bit um, as well. So I can definitely see it if you just say you want to know something. I want to go with the most skilled guys here. Um, but you know, for me personally, I, I think maybe one of those guys and coupling them with somebody who you feel a little bit more confident in their innings is possible. Again, to your point, some people have different, um, tolerances for risk early on in drafts. And, and so, um, for me, I want to get a little bit more of an anchor, but uh, again, I can definitely see it. They're both really exciting guys. And Glasnow's ADP in the main event so far is 26.8. So, I mean, he's right in that spot. Scoobles 34.6. So it's not like Jason Reach for those guys. It's kind of where they go. Even Glasnow a couple picks after. Um, Glasnow is someone that it's moving up quick. I think that, uh, you know, making it through spring training healthy was the first big step. As we get to Vegas drafts here, we can kind of, you know, cross that part off at least. And at least you're in the season with him healthy. Uh, you know, we hope obviously we've got, you know, what is that? You know, a week or a week until we do main events in Vegas. But, you know, there's made a lot of main events next week. But, you know, about 10 days till the season starts. Um, so I think, you know, getting him through there is, uh, is really important. Um, which takes me to uh, where we're at the end of the third round here. We've got our first closers. We have um, Edwin Diaz at pick 313 to um, uh, Brian Bellinger and then um, Dan Preface with Josh Hader in, in 14 and then Yoan Duran at, uh, at the turn of Scott Fleming. So the, the, the relievers are coming off the board uh, fast and furious here at the end of the third round, start of the fourth round. Uh, where are you in the closer market to start this season? Uh, you look at ADP for the main event, uh, Diaz is 39, um, we draw haters, 48 Duran's 48. So right in this range, uh, what's your thought on the, uh, on the closer market, uh, as, as you jump into uh, some bigger drafts here? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I want to say like, I know I was a little bit critical of the Jordan Alvarez, uh, pick in the first round, but like to see the way that Bellinger's team has come together there with J Ram falling in the yeah. second round right there. So you kind of address the speed issue that you had with Alvarez and, uh, Jose Ramirez is a, is a corner, right? And you're not necessarily anticipating getting speed from the corner. So you still have yeah. your second base, your shortstop, your middle infield to help you get that speed that you lost with taking Alvarez. Um, for closers, I, I like the, that Diaz pick right there. I think it's a really strong pick. I think Diaz is kind of uh, head and shoulders, the number one closer um, on my board. Um, was, that, you know, uh, was that that case before Devin Williams? Or did you have Williams up there with him? Um, I didn't, I did not, I did not okay. take Williams. Um, for me, it's a little bit of Diaz, you know, I wanted to see him pitch and thankfully we got some stat, stat cast data on his first outing. The Vila was a little bit down, but I think he had like seven whiffs on 15 pitches or something ridiculous. So it was, it was, dumb. Um, he, he looked nasty. Yeah. I mean, the context is perfect. You know, it was a little, it was a fluke injury, you know, he's, he's had, he's been steady throughout. So I think he's got the most skills. 
Um, I think it's just a question of, you know, kind of wh where you're taking your closers, right? I think there are some pretty good closers sprinkled um, throughout the draft, but this is where we're starting to see them go. And yeah, on this turn, Diaz is gone. Hayter's gone. Duran's usually gone. We've got some closers filling in um, in there as well. So obviously they're moving up a little bit, but I, I think we're not, you know, we're not too far removed, I think, from two seasons ago or maybe even last year where we had some closers going on the on the one-two turn. Was that was that Hater Hendricks? Was that the combo that was? I think that was. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah two years ago, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's right. It was there was a year where those two guys were like either mid second, but even moving up uh, towards the start of the second round. But uh, we are getting to the point in uh, in fifteen teamers, and it's it's interesting. It, we should mention that this is a standalone league, so there's no overall component to this. Obviously, it's a big money league. Um, you play in some standalone. I think you have a standalone auction. Is that right? Yeah, I, I have a, a standalone auction, and uh, I'm in. You know, the auctions that I'm in are, are part of an overall competition, but, um, you know, you're really going, yeah. focusing mostly on the league just because that, uh, that carries enough weight. So talk to us real quick about how, how you differ in a standalone league versus an overall challenge. Obviously with an overall, you know, you really punting a category can work within your league. It's really hard to win overalls. If you punt, there have been some instances of like, you gotta be perfect in the nine categories. Like it's really hard to do there. There's some instances that, you know, maybe like 30th percentile and in one category and just great the other nine uh, do you tend to punt in a standalone? Obviously, you only have to win the league. There is no overall component. You, you know, one point in a category is, uh, you know, you can, you can live with that, whereas it's hard to do that in overall. Where do you kind of fall that, fall with uh, standalone versus a, versus a draft spot or a, versus an overall contest? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I like to, I don't like to punt. Um, I generally take a fairly similar approach. I actually think in overall competitions, you know, last year, um, Brian Slack, um, uh, and and Dylan White when they won the uh, when they won the overall uh, for the main I think they were 75th percentile in steals and it okay. kind of opened my mind a little bit about you know yes you need to be balanced and you need to be pretty good I mean 75th percentile is nothing to sneeze at right, right. I think that's I, my math is really terrible so I won't even try to guess uh, how many that is um, uh, how many points that is in a league but. Um, uh, I think, I think you don't, I think you can be balanced, but you can excel in certain categories that give you a little bit of flexibility to be not as good in other ones. When I'm doing, when I'm approaching a, um, standalone, I might, I might be a little bit more willing to not punt a category. Right. Cause when I think of punting, I think like, right. you're getting one, like you're yeah. just bombing. Right. But like a good, a good, a good example, may be like an approach like Scott Fleming is taking right here, right. Where he's addressing his starting pitcher. He's gotten his saves. He's gotten two bats. He's gotten two veterans where you kind of know what you're going to get from them. And if I were to say there's one weakness in that in his team so far, it's steals, right? Yeah. Where Altuve is probably getting you 10 to 15 maybe this year, something like that. So maybe instead of going for the 80th percentile in your draft and steals, you're fine hitting the 60th, right? So, yeah. you know, instead of getting, you know, 12 points, you're going to be fine with six or seven in the league because you know you can lose those points if it allows you to gain them in other places. So you're able to kind of approach the draft with a little bit more of an open mind and be a little bit more flexible in who you choose. Yeah, that's uh, that's really well said. Uh, funny comment. Jason Wanick, Wanick in the uh, comment, how you doing with this player championship on? Um, it's on right there. I'm rooting for Xander Shoffley, but uh, so I do have it on for the ask about the golf tournament. Uh, question, uh, Toby, how do you feel about uh, Max Freed for Daniel Preppis? He went, uh, we have seen an, uh, a big pitching run. We've got... Uh, 10 out of 12 picks in the middle of the fourth round uh, were, were yellow stickers on the board. A lot of pitchers in there, a couple of closes, but a lot of starters kind of go in this range. We've seen this in the main event so far. That end of third through like middle fifth, there are just all the pitchers that were like fourth to six are all going in that spot. Um, of, the, of the guys in this range, you could talk about Freed, Valdez, Nola, Bobby Miller, Grayson Rodriguez, Logan Webb. And Logan Gilbert, like, uh, do you have a you have a strong feeling on uh, a couple of those guys? Uh, you know, a far ahead of the other group. Is anybody in the group you don't like? Uh, where do you feel with this? Like this middle grouping of uh, there are just a ton of pitchers that go in the spot. Yeah, um, I, uh, you'll have to mention those pitchers again, just because I was looking at Max Freed. Yeah. Um, just uh, the the fourth round there, just like the, those names of the fourth round. Uh, you know, Bobby Miller, Grayson Rodriguez, Webb, Gilbert, uh, Freed, Valdez, and Nola. I guess were the were the seven guys that went in that round. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think I feel pretty comfortable. Like like with Freed, I have him on my board as I think he's like SP. I think he's player forty nine, right? So right okay. about where he's going. Yeah. And and once you get to this part of the draft, there's very small differences between the players, right? Like at the top, you may have three or four dollars in between guys, but right here in the draft, we're talking about 
you know, four players that are $20 players and one's 20 and 15 cents and one's 20 75. So I think all of these guys can go. Um, when I think about, you know, freed my, you know, one concern is around the injury last year. Obviously he doesn't, uh, he doesn't throw a ton of strikeouts, but he's never not had good ratios, right? Yep. So he's a really solid lo ratio lockdown. Framber Valdez has improved, um, you know, pretty much year, year over year. He provides you with a lot of volume. Um, and so, um, you know, that's, that's something you like. Nola was going in the second round last year, right? And yes, he didn't pitch all that great, but he seems to be a guy who can have some tough years due to the home runs that he's giving up. Um, Bobby Miller, you know, looks really good, but he doesn't have the track record. So you never know. I know a lot of people like Grayson Rodriguez. I, I have him pretty far down my board. So he's not somebody I'm looking at really in that spot. I uh, I love Bobby Miller this year. I, uh, I'm probably a little biased that, you know, living in L.A., I've seen him up close a, a number of times. I actually sat uh, really close last year and watched him pitch. Um, I just – I love the 6% walk rate by, by a rookie. Like, there's just – rookies that hey, come in with a good walk rate right away. Like, that is – that's so big to me. 124 innings. I think the strikeouts are going to jump. You look at his minor league strikeout numbers, and they are – they're massive. I know he hasn't thrown a ton of innings, but like you look at Double A in in twenty twenty two, a thirty percent strikeout rate. I think that twenty three and a half is going up. Uh, if he can maintain the walks, man, I just I think he's going to be so nasty. I think that you, you. So we talked about Glass now. Uh, obviously Yamamoto on the Dodgers. You know you got Bobby Mill on the Dodgers. Also, you get all the all the benefit there. Unfortunately, he's getting pushed up. The the, the price we had in February is not the price anymore. Uh, he's middle of the fourth round. Uh, but Bobby Miller's like the the young risky one that I'm willing to take a shot on this point. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I like to do with pitchers is is um, is kind of take a look at what they've done in the past, right? And little stretches where they may have been, um, you know, really successful what they were doing. Maybe they had a velo bump. Maybe they had a pitch mix change. And I know with Miller, there were stretches of the season last year where he was really strong, you know, and where there were some stretches where the K rate wasn't necessarily where you want it to be, but then there was some improvement in it. And so looking for those types of things, I think that's where you can kind of see the jump happening or that somebody has already done something. And that gives you a better sense of whether they're going to be able to do that for the longer term over the course of a full season. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, too. We got more pitches coming off the board here in the in the fifth round. Uh, we're at the spot where Yuri Perez was going. He's a, he was an 80. He was 80 off the board in ADPs and in the first uh, first five main events. What do you do if you're sitting in this draft right now, Toby? You're drafting today. You're drafting tonight. We've got this this news that Yuri Perez is going for imaging on his elbow. Like that is his throwing elbow. Like it just – it doesn't get much worse than that. I mean, it could be minor, you know, but it's weird that it was like a fingernail and now we're going for imaging. Uh, are you are you one that would be like, you know, maybe in three rounds I'll take a shot on this? Or you're like, I just don't want to deal with this. It's a preseason. Guys are getting hurt anyway. Uh, what do you do with someone like that as you're like in the moment drafting? You, you're kind of up in the air with news. Yeah, I mean, generally, I'll play it a little bit safe. I'll play it a little bit conservative in those instances. I don't want to push it if I don't need to, especially because, like, it's one thing for, like, a Garrett Cole, for instance, right, where it's like, you know what you're going to get. If he's healthy, you know what you're going to get. We saw what Yuri can do last year, but we've never seen him put it together for that full season in the big league. So yeah. in addition to in addition to the questions around the health, there's still got to be questions around performance. And obviously, like, you have to look at it from – the perspective of, do I think Yuri Perez is going to be good? Probably, right? You know, and yep. then what is the chances that he's going to be good? And what are the chances that he may not be as good? And then you factor in the in injury. And I think it's just a, a little bit too much of a question mark, especially when you have some really good pitchers who are still available, you know, at this point in time in the draft. So, um, you know, in that particular example, like I, I'm probably playing it a little bit of safe and, and generally I'll play it a little bit safe as well. I think a lot of times, like you can't necessarily win I think many people have said this, but like you can't really win a draft at the draft, but you can lose a draft at the draft. And so anytime there's a question mark like that, I'm generally going to play it safe. First five rounds, we've got uh, every team has two or three pitchers except for t two of them. We've got um, Eric Albright has uh, George Kirby, and then with uh, Bobby Witt, Ozzy Albies, O'Neill Cruz, and Cody Bellinger. Kind of a fun team there. And John Limbaris has uh, only one pitcher, Logan Webb, with Betts, Devers, uh, Luis Robert and uh, Jazz Chisholm. How do you, um, through five rounds, how many pitchers do you want? Uh, you know, kind of in a, I know it's, you know, draft draft specific, but in a general field, you want, do you want two? Do you want three? Are you okay with one? Where do you, uh, what, how many pitchers do you want in the first five rounds? 
Yeah, I'm going for five, Scott. I really want to just start off. Forget pocket aces. I want that. Where is uh, where is Delton Del Don when we need him? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I think I'm probably looking at, um, I think in an ideal world, I'd have three, probably. Okay. Um, two or three um, with some flexibility. I think it always depends on like where you're at in the draft and who's available and who you like, right? right? I think that's one of the things that you have to think to yourself is, and that's one of the reasons why I kind of like to play the draft out ahead of time is like, to think about that board and to be like, okay, like if the guys that fall to where I think they're going to fall come in an ideal world, this is what I look like, or not even in an ideal world, but this right. is a likely outcome. Yep. And then you can shift and, and, and adjust based on that. But let's say you're coming to a, a point where you need to decide whether you're going to take a pitcher or a hitter, you need to be able to say, okay, am I getting to draft soon? And if so, do I think what's the probability that that guy that I want is going to come back to me? Or if you have to wait a long time, the guys that I expect to be there next time, like what is the combo that I like more? This hitter right. and this pitcher or this pitcher and then getting the hitter that's probably going to be available there. So I think it's yeah. just playing that game out like every single draft pick essentially. And, and really good point. I mean, obviously what you've done before impacts what you're going to do and what, what you kind of see coming up next impacts each pick. You got to look at what's coming down the line. That's a really good, you know, I'm not sure a lot of people do that. People are just like, oh, I'm taking the best player right now, but you really have to know what's coming next round and how that affects uh, what you do now. So I got to ask you, pick 75 to Scott Fleming. We had the uh, the the buzzy player of the year. You know, last year was Corbin Carroll. A couple years ago was Bobby Witt. Wyatt Langford, pick 75 overall. I know there was a quote today that he's not guaranteed to make the roster. If you read, you've read the quote, it's like, yeah, he's pretty much done everything possible to make the roster without them actually saying it. I, I think that he's uh, pretty, pretty sure to, to to break camp with the with the Rangers. Uh, where are you and Wyatt, Wyatt Langford? It's a guy we have to make a decision on because if you want him, uh, this is probably the spot you got to take him. Yeah, you know, I've had him plugged into my spreadsheet at 600 plate appearances just because it seems like he's going to make it. And I think he's really good. And he, he he comes out to player 157 for me. And obviously projections can be, you know, pretty, wow. yeah, pretty, um, pretty down on younger players. And they've missed players in the past. I mean, last year, Corbin Carroll, right? Like one of the reasons I didn't have him on any teams right. was because of, um, do yeah, you because, like because projection. jump in and like manually change stuff then? Or you just, what, what it comes out, comes out. Well, I just kind of, I, I, I'll change playing time. You know, okay. like if I think playing time's wrong, then I'll get in there and, and make a couple changes. Part of it though, a lot of that is like towards the back end of the draft though, because really like, you know, I'm confident in the ability of projections overall. They may miss a certain type of player or something like that, but I'm, I am confident in their ability to identify the skill level of players and so if they're identifying the skill levels of players, then the major tweak that you can make is around playing time. So guys right. later on in the draft, I may bump them up to 600 plate appearances to say, okay, what, is he, what does it look like if this person gets full-time playing time? You know, and see where that, that goes and kind of take that into consideration. With somebody like, like Langford, you know, I'm, I'm fine missing out. You know, I didn't have any right. Carroll last year, but I still did fine. Right. And I think part of that is because like, look at who's going around Langford, right? Okay, you have Nolan Jones, a guy who's already gone 2020 in a partial season, plays in cores, you know? So it's not like the guys around him. You have JTR, right? Yeah. Like, all of these guys, Yelich, you've got William Contreras, you've got all of these guys who are really, really good. So this high up in the draft, the question isn't just like, is Wyatt Langford going to be worth the pick that he's at, right? The right. question is like, is he is the risk of taking Wyatt Langford and the lack of knowledge around how good he's going to be is that and the potential upside that that includes too is that more important or is it more valuable than getting a known quantity like a JTR or a Nolan Jones or a Christian Yelich or somebody like that and for me the the answer there is is honestly kind of um kind of no in a lot of instances but Later on in drafts, I'll be happy to take that that shot. And this is even a different one, too, because we talk about how we never know what a young player is going to do. But sometimes we have, you know, a season and a half in double A. We've got, uh, what do we have? I'm doing the math real quick, like 44 games of him in the mind. He was drafted last year in the draft. He was a 2023 fourth overall pick. I mean, this is as as fresh and new as a guy can be getting in the majors. It's just, we usually can look at a minor league, minor league stats and be like, oh, you know, he strikes out too much or he's got a lot of speed. Like, we have no idea. We know he's super talented, but yeah, I don't think I'm doing it at 75 myself. Um, I do get it, and he could be really good, but uh, I think you'd have to f fall further than that. It's, just, it's not going to happen. Yeah, totally. And I, and I think it depends on which 
projection system you're looking at, right? Like Steamer has him right now for 24 homers and 12 steals, 80, 80, 265. I mean, that's yeah. a really solid line, right? You'd be happy with him if he provides that line. Whereas the bat has him, you know, 16 homers, a 242 average, 12 steals in 506 plate appearances. So if you boost that up to 600, you know, the home runs are relatively um, similar, but it still gives you combined, you know, not necessarily the best, right? Like look at JTR, right? You're talking about a guy who's a catcher, who's going to provide you a pretty similar line, right? Who's done a 24, 15 before with about a 260 average from the catcher position versus outfield. So that's really like the question that, that I get into, right? Is like, is 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 you can't just compare him to what you think he's going to do. You also have to compare him to what other players that going around him are. So what uh, what do you feel about the catcher market this year? We're at, we're at the spot of the draft. We've got uh, Adley Rutschman was taken at uh, five point five. Then um, Real Muto in the start of the sixth. Then William Contreras, Will Smith just went off the board seven point four. Uh, there are a lot of catchers this year. As you, as you flip through, there's a lot of catchers that like in a twelve teamer. I'm not even worried about catcher at all. Like, I just think that there's enough guys. If you have a one catcher league, like, I'm really not worried about it at all at all, which are usually like uh, the first five or six guys that it falls off. Because like there's, you know, 13, 14, 15 guys that are pretty serviceable. Obviously, these top guys are pretty legit. Um, do you have a favorite catcher? How do you feel about the, the catcher market in 2024 coming in drafts? Yeah, not really a favorite catcher. You know, I think the guys who have been there who have done it, a lot of different times. I mean, JTR is always my favorite catcher, yeah. right? But I, like, you know, I was kind, of, I was kind of setting you up for that answer. Yeah, you were, you were, you were setting me up. You know, yeah. I don't want to give away my hand too early here, Scott. You know, <laughs> um, but no, I mean, I obviously love JTR and what he gives you. It's a little bit different than the other catchers. One of the things that I have in my spreadsheet is I have um, ADP, and then I have what what I have them ranked, and then I have like what I call a value column, and it's just a very quick divide. I can never remember whether it's ADP by rank or whatever, but it essentially Above one means you're getting a value. Below right, one means right. that you're that you're not. You know, I have a lot of catchers that are above a two value, right? Where they are, they are bringing you a ton of value, right? They're okay. almost double what their rank is compared to ADP, and part of that may be the position, um, uh, you know, bump that you're getting from the catcher position. But I feel pretty good at a lot of different spots in the draft about being able to get a catcher. I do like getting one of those earlier ones if I can. But again, if I find a really good value that's a pitcher or another position, I may wait on that. So like I've gotten a lot of uh, kind of mid-round catchers recently, like in my in my two DCs. Um, I definitely have one JTR, but then I think I have one Sal Perez and then a Kybert Ruiz and yeah. a couple other guys in there. So I, I really think there's a lot of value at the catcher position. I will say um, just um, in 12-teamers, catchers are actually uh, – top-end catchers are – at least theoretically more valuable because the, the difference in players is so small in 12 teamers, the difference between replacement that yep. you can actually get a huge boost between those higher ranked catchers and um, the lower ranked catchers than in other positions, the way they break down. So I would just put that out there, um, Scott, not to, not to, you know, go against you or be controversial, but um, I really actually hi highlight, uh, catchers and 12 teamers. No, I, I like that. Be controversial is go against me. I, I fully get that. Um, I think that in a 12 team, I'm probably getting like two that I like rather than worrying about a top end one. Cause I think that the difference between that, like, four, yeah, I will call it a top 15 is a big difference between that. Like the, the 23, 24, 21, like the guys, like the teams that wait a little bit and he has those last four catchers. Like I think it does make a big difference in there. A uh, couple of them asked what the format of this draft is. It is 30 rounds, uh, fab league. Um, so just a regular drafted league, uh, 20, uh, 23 starters, 14 hitters, nine pitchers, uh, kind of the normal roto stuff with, uh, with seven bench spots, no IL. So typical NFBC, uh, format with, uh, with fab. So just, I saw quite a couple questions there. Uh, Toby, we saw, uh, Yuri Perez go off the board 7.6 to, uh, John Limbaris. Um, not where I would have taken him. I have to admit, uh, I think that is a, uh, I think that's too early for what the news we've heard today. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't go there. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't have Perez rated all that highly. I think one of the challenges always with rookie pitchers too, especially looking at the way that the Marlins used him last year, you know, where they really reined him in, you know, that they're going to be cautious. Um, you know, how competitive are they going to be this year? I mean, they obviously have some pitching and that's helped them be competitive, but um, I think the volume is going to be challenging. And then I think when you 
when you think about like build and stuff like that, you, we mentioned that team um, only had Logan Webb so far for pitchers. So you're kind of, you know, from a volume perspective, there's some catch up that you're going to need to do. And then you have a question mark about, you know, how much, how healthy uh, one of the pitchers is going to be too. Our, uh, our host, Mike Masato, is leaning into the risk in this draft. He's got uh, from the nine spies, he's got Ellie De La Cruz, Bobby Miller, Cole Reagans, and Bailey Ober. A lot of buzzy guys, a lot of young guys in there. Um, he's uh, He appears to be trying to win this league or maybe just uh, go down in flames. But uh, where are you on uh, Cole Reagans, a, a name that uh, was really good at the end of last year, a uh, very popular name, people moving up. Uh, Nick Pollock, a pitcher list, might be single-handedly moving up his uh, his ADP by the minute. I know loves Cole Reagans. Uh, where are you on Cole Reagans? Yeah, I mean, I like Cole Reagans. I had him back into last year, and it's hard to forget what he was able to do for for some teams there. Um, you know, I think there's some challenges. There's the injury history that Reagans has. Obviously, like the velo bump that he experienced last year was fantastic. Um, you know, velo bumps also come with a little bit more risk with, right. uh, you know, uh, additional injury. He's on the Ro- a Royals team that I don't love their bullpen. Um, I don't love their team context. Um, really at all. Um, and so I'm, I'm, you know, I don't necessarily see getting him where he's going right now. I think there are other players going around where he's going that I would rather have, but I can definitely see like, would we be surprised if Cole Reagans, you know, is a top 10 pitcher next year? I, I don't think so, but would you be surprised if he's, you know, having his second or third Tommy John, like not necessarily <laughs> either. Right. So, um, and I don't mean to be like, you know, flippant with an injury like that, but it's just one of those things where, um, you know, you're hoping you get that honeymoon period they talk about. And, and, and um, yeah, so I, I just, I like some other pitchers more. You have upset our Kansas city friend, Anthony Gialdi with a, how dare you in the comments. So I uh, just, so you know that uh, you have created one enemy in this podcast, Toby. So that's, uh, that's not too For bad. Sure. I, I, one one, one the, is not bad. One of the challenges about trying to be uh, insightful and honest in these, uh, <laughs> in these, uh, in these efforts is you may hurt some feelings. And what I will say is, you know, like, I'm not like, it's really hard to understand what somebody's thought process is or what they're thinking with their later picks by looking at their draft board. Right. And we, we can't put it together really easily. So it's a challenge. So no offense to anybody at all, but, um, all of of your teams look absolutely atrocious from here. (laughs) Um, we have officially, I think every single team has a closer, which I'm a little bit surprised by in a Stanley League. I'm surprised that someone didn't, uh, you know, kind of push it down the road. And, you know, if I get some closers waiting, great. But I think every, I'm looking at teams here, uh, every single team has a closer. I'm a little bit surprised by that. Yeah, that is, that is, uh, that is really interesting. Um, everybody I think David, David, like Einhorn, the risk David Einhorn approach. was the last one. He took uh, Kenley Jansen Kenley in the Jansen. Uh, eighth round here. I think that was the, I think that was the one team that was, uh, that was still uh, holding off a closer. I'm, uh, I'm surprised that through eight rounds, everybody has a closer in a, in a standalone like this. Yeah, um, for sure. I mean, it's, it's definitely an interesting approach. Are there, is there anybody who has two? Uh, there must be somebody. I thought I saw somebody. With that. Oh yeah, Duran and Duran, 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 Duran and Jordan Romano. It's a, a powerful combo. So Scott Fleming at the end took took Zach Lee in the first round. That's his only starter so far. Yeah, yeah. That's it's it's an interesting approach um, for sure. I mean, you've got two closers that you feel really good about, right? So you're thinking sixty saves. You're thinking really strong ratios to couple yep. with Wheeler. Probably one hundred twenty innings. So you look at the combination of those two, you've got yourself, you know, 300 innings of really solid ratios. You like the win potential out of Wheeler. It's going to be interesting to see for sure how um, how Scott fills in the back end of that pitching and, and can get to that volume that he he knows he needs to get to as well. Yeah, for sure. In the middle of the draft here, we got uh, Jody Ryan going with four straight pitchers in rounds uh, four, five, six, and seven. A bill that I... Uh, I do like that is something that I'm strongly considering kind of three hitters, then three or four pitches right back to back. I do like that middle range there. Um, He took Tanner Bybee uh, who had a really, really good rookie year. Um, I like Bybee every time I look at him, I'm like, I'm sure I can poke some holes here. I really like Bybee. Uh, Where are you on, uh, on Bybee coming into year two? I know that, uh, you know, a rookie year with a 290 ERA is one thing you're like, yeah, you know, hard to replicate that. But how do you kind of feel about him as a pitcher? Cause I, you look at minor league numbers and there might even be a little strikeout, a little more, a little more, a few more punch outs in this profile. Yeah, um, you know, Bybee does not show up that 
solid on mine. So uh, on my spreadsheet. So he hasn't necessarily been a target. Okay. Um, I want to say, um, you know, with all of these pitchers, I don't just look at the spreadsheet. I also look into and kind of do a more of an analysis of skills. I don't have what I saw in front of me, but it definitely wasn't enough for me to look at it and say, you know, okay, I'm going to overrule the projections here and bump him up considerably. I think even in this range, there are some pitchers going, you know, um, around here that I like, uh, I like more, uh, than I like him either because they have a track record or because they showed something in the second half last year that, um, maybe impressed me a little bit more than Bybee did. Other, uh, other pitches this round, uh, Joe Musgrove, uh, Yuri Perez will leave him out of this, but Bailey Ober, Justin Steele, Michael King. Do you like any of those? Um, you know, a decent amount more than you like Bybee. Um, yeah, I like Ober. Um, I like Ober. Um, I mean, I think, you know, um, you know, if you think about like an emphasis that some people are putting on ratios, you know, this year, like Ober's a guy who fits into that where last year, you know, he struggled a little bit from an ERA perspective, but even when he did that, he still had a pretty good whip and he projects for a pretty good whip. And I think early on in a draft, right, you have to assume that the later picks are going to have a negative impact on your whip. And so if you haven't built that nice whip or that nice ERA cushion into your team early on, then I think you're struggling. And I think that time of the draft is about the right time to look at some of those guys who maybe have a little bit higher upside, but you feel like are still relatively safe. You know, as long as they pitch, they're going to be successful. So uh, Ober kind of kind of fits that build a, a little bit for me too. Yeah, I like that. Uh, Michael King, do you think, uh, what kind of in innings numbers are you think we're getting from Michael King moving, making the move from the, uh, the bullpen to the starting uh, rotation? I know he started the last eight games last year for the Yankees and pitched pretty well. Uh, what's your projection for him on the number of innings that they, they let him go out there? Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, for King, I don't think I have him uh, that high up there either. I know he had a really successful um, end of last season yeah. and was really good, but I think that... Um, you know, it's hard in a small sample. And I think it's also hard, like when you think about the context of a full season as a starter um, and kind of what that does to you uh, and, the, and the innings pitched. And so I have not been getting him in the few drafts that I have done. Um, I have him as uh, player 160 uh, right now on the spreadsheet. That's based on around 130 innings um, for him. So if he can get uh, well above that, then you know, maybe there's some value that he brings to the equation, but um, that's what I have him right now in my projection. You're not, you're not a football fan, right, Toby? Uh, I mean, I watch football, but um, just, I'm not. Uh, not Justin Fields, it. Justin Fields got traded to the Steelers. Oh, wow, to the Steelers. Yeah, so I, that's I, interesting. I, Russell Wilson's reign in uh, in in Pittsburgh might not be very long. That's oh pretty wild. Oh my God, Russell Wilson. <laughs> I, I was in. I'm I'm a Seahawks fan. Oh, um, that's if right. I can I didn't call know myself that, yeah. a fan of anything, and and man. Uh, Russ's decline has been monumental. Yeah. I mean, what a trade by the Seahawks that was. Wow. Yeah, that that worked out really well. Um, so a, a name that uh, just got taken in the eighth round that is, uh, we talked about polarizing names with Ellie De La Cruz. Uh, Estuary Ruiz is in the eighth round. Um, someone that, w without exaggerating, like could steal 70, could not be starting in June. Like they're, they're, the, the range of outcome for him is probably more than anybody else in the first round. You take injury out of it just performance-based. Like, he could be an insanely valuable guy in the eighth round. He could be someone that kills you in the eighth round. Uh, how do you feel about someone like this? The person that took him had um, has Mookie Betts, so a few steals there. Has Luis Roberts, some steals there. Has Jazz Chisholm, some steals there, too, to go on with Rafael Devers. Uh, I would have thought that Ruiz would have gone to a team that did not have many steals. You're kind of like, you know, like, uh, I've screwed this up at steals-wise. I need to get a big number here. Uh, this is someone that did have a lot of steals, so I'm a little surprised there. Where are you on Ruiz? I, I want to not need to take him is kind of how probably how I would put it. But uh, where does Ruiz come out like in your projections and where are you thinking for drafts? Yeah, you know, I think the challenge always with a guy like Ruiz is uh, I was mentioning before about how even in standalone leagues, I like to build a balanced roster. And part of that balance is overall with the team, right? And what the stats look like. But it also has to do with the component part. So each player you try to have as balanced of a profile as possible, um, you know, just as, as risk mitigation, right? So if you spread those steals out between a broader set of players, yep. then you can, you can um, adapt and you can move and you can address issues as they come up with injuries that are inevitable, right? But if you have all of your steals in one guy, 
um, then you uh, put yourself in a position, one guy who doesn't do other things, then you put yourself in a position where if you lose that guy, you're really challenging. So let's say the rest of the draft, this team who, who got Ruiz is like, okay, I'm good on speed and now I'm just going to attack because really you have to now, right? Ruiz right. doesn't have power. Um, you know, his batting average is mediocre, I think. So like, yeah, he doesn't the, have power. The, the, the 19% hard hit rate doesn't, doesn't uh, make you think there's some power coming? I, I, I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> Play, playing in Oak, Oakland is always a benefit yeah. to your power numbers as well. Um, <laughs> right. But the challenge is now you're trying to play catch up on your homers, right? Yeah. And your RBI and your other things that you're missing out on in Ruiz. And so you start to, over, you, you, you just naturally have to compensate for that. And so whether you want to or not, the rest of your team ends up being a low speed team because by nature, like there aren't balanced profiles available later on in the draft. And so I think that's the challenge of a pick like that is that both it, for the rest of the draft, you're a little handcuffed. And then if something happens in season, you're a little handcuffed. And for that reason, I like to stay and be a little bit more um, balanced in my approach to addressing the categories um, than that approach. Right. But if he stays healthy, then, you know, he could get you, um, he could get you some value. Right. So it works both ways. It does. I just, uh, the risk of him just like flat out losing that job is, is too real for me. I just, I can't do it in the, in this round. I think like last year he was kind of in the, in the 14, 15, 16 range. And then he got pushed up a lot in the main event. Uh, Sean Childs pushed him up, like really liked him. So moved, he moved up a lot of main events, but I just, I think the, the, the theory of, taking guys who just can't hit like just scares the crap out of me every time. And I, I know sometimes you got to do it. Um, I just one who wants to do it later in the draft. And that leads me into my, my question here. We had a, we saw a massive bump in stolen bases in the majors last year, the new rules, the bigger bases, the, the, uh, the, the, the step offs, the, uh, the time, the pitch clock, all that stuff kind of, uh, you know, works in, in stolen bases, uh, in stolen, guys who steal bases, their benefit. Um, how does that impact what you do this year? Are you just like, well, I need to make sure I'm, you know, getting mine, but there's a lot of more to get. But to, does, it, does it impact your strategy at all? How you kind of feel in those, you know, these first ten rounds? Um, like, are you, are you hyper focused on making sure you get them? Because you don't, you're in trouble. There's so many of them. What, what do you kind of feel on that? Yeah, I mean, I think you're focused on getting a really solid base, right? And knowing who later on in the draft you can pivot to um, when the opportunity arises, right? A around speed. I think I've approached it different ways. I mean, some of the teams that I've drafted, I've gone after that 80th percentile, and then with other teams that I've drafted. I've been a little bit more comfortable being at the 70th or the 60th. Yep. I think one of the things about speed and the profiles of players that do have speed is that it seems a little bit more available on the waiver wire than other things will be, right? Because it's not necessarily really good hitters that are speedsters. And so if you can build a really solid base across the board and give yourself the opportunity to chase speed a little bit um, during the season... Um, I think that that's not necessarily an approach that I would that I would shun. So I think if and it's also one of those categories, like when you look at the the categories that are like connected to each other, it's a little bit of an island, you know, not entirely, but like it's it's similar to saves in that sense, where it's a little bit less correlated with some of the other um, other offensive categories, and so it is something that's that's a little bit on an island there in terms of how you go about getting. And it's kind of funny the fact that you know we're talking about an island, and then you look at uh, you look at Mark Perlmutter's team who drafted fifth. Just looking quick here, took Corbin Carroll in the first round, so a ton of steals. But then uh, Vlad Guerrero, Adley Rutschman, Tristan Casas, Nolan Arenado, like no steals. I mean, I know Vlad had a, a couple here and there. Like we're tossing in a few, but like that's one stolen base guy in the first nine rounds, and pretty much nobody else. Um, you know, one of those things. Carroll gets hurt, you probably punt steals and you just let it go in a in a standalone. But it's interesting that you know, we're talking about Ruiz. Like the guy, Mark Perlmutter did it the same thing just with a first round pick. Yeah, totally. I, I think that that's something something that you and that's one of the things that I say like about like why it's hard to look at a draft board and analyze it right is like you have to have the context of the league. So like you said, you could go after a few big steal guys and be like, look, you know, I'm gonna kind of punt this category or hope to finish middle of the pack. But if I get a one or two in the category, cause these guys get hurt or something, right. then I'm fine adapting. So I think that's a really good point. And one of the reasons why it's really challenging to analyze just the draft board is because you don't understand the, tr the strategy or the thought process behind it. Yeah. Uh, question in the chat, Toby, how far does Garrett Cole call Garrett Cole fall? I'm going to miss your, um, 
does Garrett Cole still suck memes and gifts uh, this year? I'm just going to be a bummer not to see that. Uh, I, you know, Eddie Rosario is not playing very much. We're going to lose that one too. Like, who are you going to gif about? It's not. Man, there's no. Yeah. There's no Vlad Guerrero uh, walk of shame this year. What's uh? What's a a? Where's Cole going? And B, who's going to be the uh, the Toby gift this year? Well, I mean, I think Cole Cole's going to be a really interesting one because the news earlier today was he believes that he's only going to. I mean, he's going to be shut down for a month, essentially. Um, and then he's going to ramp back up. So you're probably looking at if all of that comes to fruition, just make sure you like read in between the lines, right? Like right. if he's shut down for a month, that doesn't mean he's back in four weeks, right? It doesn't that mean means, he's back in a month. That, that means, means 10 weeks, right? That's 10 that's weeks. That, that's yeah. like, yeah, eight to 10 weeks. So it's like, so he's going to miss two months of the season. So I think what you have to do is essentially say, okay, you know, Garrett Cole, actually I'll do that right now. Um, Garrett Cole, let's say he's going to get, um, he's going to do four, he's going to do three fifths of a season. And okay. if he thought that he was going to throw 200, so let's give him 120 innings. This might take a little bit, so it may be no, kind of good. boring. We, uh, um, we, might, we might be here for a little bit, so we're good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> if you take um, Garrett Cole, I have my spreadsheet. So now I've got to just be able to um, see him in here. Um, and make sure that I'm looking at pitchers as opposed to hitters. You know, that would also benefit. So right now I have Cole for, um, I think it's 175 innings in my spreadsheet just because I haven't updated it since then. Okay. 120 innings, again, assuming that everything goes exactly as it should. Uh, Garrett Cole becomes player 135. Okay. He so went, uh, he went, he went a buck 40 in one of the main events this afternoon. So, uh, you know, maybe someone is kind of doing, you know, not the same math as you, but a, a similar kind of setup. Um, he went 42 in one of the main events. Uh, there's been five main events. He's gone 42 and 232. Like you want to talk about a range. That is a range right there. Um, I think someone's going to take him before I'm willing to do it. I know that the, I, I what you're doing with the math is actually perfect. Like you want to just map it out. I just think that uh, there's so many ways I can go sideways. Like there's a spot I'll take him. I just think someone's probably going to do it before me. Absolutely. And the thing is too, I think your thought process um, should be, or not should be right. Like it could be theoretically. Um, okay. If everything goes perfectly well, he's going to yep. hit 120 innings. Well, like, do I factor in the fact that maybe things won't go perfectly well, right? Which I think ne you should. Never, never happens with pitchers. You should, right? Yeah. So let's say that you want to say, okay, I think that there's that that's a possibility. And I also think that there's a 20% chance that, you know, Garrett Cole, or let's say 25% chance um, that, or no, 20%, let's do, let's stick with 20%. Let's just say there's a 20% chance that Garrett Cole is going to miss the entire season. So let's lop off 20 innings and just assume, okay, if I factor in everything, all of the probability, he's only going to get 100 innings. Then he becomes player 213. Oh, uh, right? so that's a, that's a, those 20 innings are a big, big drop. And, and that's a huge, right? And that assumes that he pitches well, yes. right? Well, so let's say he comes back and his velo's down like it was at the back end of last season. That's one of the reasons yep. why I'm actually little and off I mean there was a because big, I wasn't big, in on Garrett Cole yeah, this year big big strikeout drop last year I mean it's, it was just it was like five percent down it's it's strike rate drop yeah. everything right yep. and so that also makes me think that maybe there's a little bit more to that and then you think about the incentives of the Yankees right like is there a major difference between them have, making him have the surgery now versus a month from now you know probably not right either way like best case scenario he's probably coming back mid 2025 if he has Tommy John surgery so also factoring in that, you know, I'd probably put him at like 80 innings or something like that. And somebody's going to get him beforehand. And I'm fine with that. Right. You know, I'm really fine with that. I think there's too many question marks. I had too many question marks to draft him, honestly, going into the season. And that's one of the major bummers is, you know, I wasn't going to draft him. And that's one more guy in, ahead of the pitchers that I do want to draft. Uh, that is going, which we all know is the most annoying thing. I would say people always possible, like, oh, right? this guy got hurt. I really want to draft him. The worst thing for me is someone who gets hurt who I did not want to draft. Oh, yeah, it God, just pushes everybody back up. I forget. There was someone that tweaked something today, and I think it was minor, but I was like, oh, I can't believe it. And it was a fade. I forget who it was, but it was just one of those things. Like, I just don't want uh, – Don't. oh, it was uh, – I can't remember. I can't remember what it was, but it was someone. I was like, "Those are just the worst." There, you want guys that you don't, you don't want to to go high. You want those guys to get pushed up. You want those guys to have some healing and move up. You want you don't want the opposite of that. But uh, uh, they're going to be uh, on a break here in a few picks. We're going to try and get somebody on to talk about the team. Uh, I just sent uh, Mike a message for a couple teams that uh, has some interesting builds, but we may get someone on to do uh, do some interviewing there. But uh, 
it's uh, it's it's been a fun first ten rounds. I mean, you see with these fifteen teamers. I think the people that uh, maybe are doing the main event for the first couple times, the first couple of years, you see all that yellow on the board. There are so many pitchers that go. I mean, you just have to. You did, you know. There's a, there's been some some stuff in the chat. Uh, Uncle Ted made a mention. You know, don't take pitchers early. Just wait. The problem is if you wait, there's just nobody left after like 10, 12, 14 rounds. It's just really, it's really tough. Yeah, for sure. People who say that generally aren't successful in their league, Scott, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, I think, I think there are different approaches, right? If you want to be consistently good at this game, like you have to recognize that 50% of the stats that come out of this game are pitchers, right? Yep. And it's the projections are fairly reliable when it comes to pitchers and their success rate, especially at the top of the draft. That's where they're most successful. The challenge is being able to identify the pitchers in the middle rounds that are successful every single year. Right. And I think we've gotten better at that in some instances because of the amount of data that we have, but it's still very, very challenging. And those are the, just, the, those are the same players that are more likely to blow up and revert back to who they were before. Right. Um, and so I really think you need that solid base to be able to um, take in some of those mistakes that you're going to make throughout the season. And so I always want to have a lot of yellow on the board um, earlier on and a little bit less later on. Right. And, and I kind of want to skip that middle of the pack group um, generally, because I think there's all, th those are the more kind of hit and miss guys yeah. um, that you'll find in the drafts and take your shots on the high upside guys that you see later on in drafts. And I, I think the key is that you you have to hit on some of those guys, but you have to hit on some of those guys in addition to your guys up top being good too. Like just hitting on a couple of those guys is great, but if you don't have they don't they're not supporting anybody else, it doesn't really matter at that point. Like if you hit on some late picks and you don't have anybody good early, you're just going to kind of be in the middle no matter what. So you just, you have to do it. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know closers are the hardest for me because I'm like I never want to take a closer, especially in the fifth sixth round. You're like, do I really want to click this over? you know, said stud hitter, but, uh, you know, you gotta do it. You gotta, you gotta build it the way, uh, the way you can. There's so many different ways to do it. Um, someone asked in the chat about, uh, Jaron Duran who just went outfielder for Boston. How do you see the, the Red Sox outfield kind of figuring itself out? Cause it's, it's an interesting little setup. Um, they got a lot of guys there, a couple got a couple of young guys with Sedane, uh, Rafaela, uh, with, uh, with William Abreu. They obviously traded for Tyler O'Neill. They got, uh, they got Yoshida there kind of DHing a bunch. They got a lot of, they got like Five or six interesting guys for three or four spots. How do you kind of see that working out? Is there anybody you're targeting in the Boston outfield? Yeah, I mean, I think. Um, well, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause you for one second on that. We do have a we do have Rob DiPietro joining us who picked oh, one no. uh, who passed on uh, Ronald Acuna. So we're gonna talk to uh, talk to him right now. Yo, one year I'm making What's up? Not too talk to it. Talk What's to up, us about. Uh, Talk to us about the first pick. You got uh, you got the first pick in KDS. Went with Strider. Why uh, why no Ronald Acuna for you? Uh, we just felt that the difference between him and the next pitchers was far greater than Acuna and the next batters, and just that gap felt strong. Just going for that big gap that he provides. So, did that, you consider? That, that was the did, you, did you consider picking taking the second pick once you got the first uh, ball out of the bin? No. Just didn't want to take the risk of it. Yeah, we do. We knew we were going straight stride the whole time. So. Toby, Rob, you guys know each other? We do actually. That? You know who got me this jersey right here? I uh, I was kidding. Jersey. I, was, I was kidding with that question. I know you guys are close. I, I know, I know, but, but this Rob Mentor jersey me. is is from uh is from Rob. Um, yeah, I mean Rob. Uh, not gonna lie, uh, I hate your team. Um, it's awful. <laughs> Um, no, I'm curious, uh, I'm curious with, um, uh, the Snell pick, uh, how you're feeling about him. He's still unsigned, obviously. Do you see it as a kind of a value because he signed somewhere eventually? Um, what's, what's the thought process there? Yeah. I mean, uh, I don't mind buying a dip. Um, I don't really think he's going to be that far off from being ready to throw. I think like the, forecast of him being able to like not be ready by middle of May. I think that's a little absurd. He was the best pitcher um, on the board for us for a long time. Um, concerned with Yuri being hurt. Bybee, you think, is completely being overdrafted. And Ober is just, we love him, but he's just a little too young. So all those guys there, it's just two times Cy Young, we're in a 230 strikeouts. Whenever he lands, we feel like he's just going to give us a solid boost. 
Yeah, it's a good call. We were talking a bunch about that round and kind of trying to figure out that it's like that third or fourth tier pitchers that you know you hit on the right guys there. You're really doing well. Uh, talk to us about uh, two catchers in the first ten rounds. You went with Wilson Contreras in the ninth, and then uh, Logan Ohapi to, to to end right before the break. Uh, was that a strategy for you? Were you planning on that? Or did you kind of work out that way? Yeah, yeah. We had been discussing catchers for like the previous couple rounds. Um, JTR was kind of you know. Um, in discussion at where we took uh, Glaber. Um, so we, we kind of had an eye on that. We like to just trying to get the 1,000 plate appearances from catchers. Um, Wilson Contreras chose him first just for that, you know, that solid batting average. Being a standalone league and not overall, we trying to keep some eye on batting average, not be like too obsessed with it, but also be cognizant of it. Um, and Ohapi, um, he's a top five catcher on my board with the plate appearances that, Oh, no. I have in for him, not the one that projections have for him. So uh, we feel good about that. Beautiful. Well, we we appreciate you jumping on. I can't have you on here without shouting out to all the content that you produce. Uh, the pull, uh, pull hitter, uh, you know, Patreon, pull hitter podcast, all really good stuff. Uh, I'm not sure there's anybody that works harder than you, Rob. You do. You, you, you fire out a lot of stuff. And it's great. I appreciate that. God, thank you so much, man. Absolutely. Good luck. Uh, good luck with the rest of the draft. We'll let you get back to it. I'm sure you guys are just taking a quick break there. So uh, good luck the rest of the way here. Later, man. Take good care, luck, Rob. Always, always good to see kind of what people think like during the middle of a draft. It's always, I'm sure Rob's like, yeah, the last thing I want to do is come talk to these guys in the middle of my draft. But um, <laughs> he loves it, it. He loves it. He does. I figured, I figured he'd be, uh, he'd be good for that. But um, yeah, it's uh it's always fun to see what people are thinking through 10 rounds because you just, you never know where you're going to be when you when you start the draft. You look at 10 rounds, you're like, I didn't see myself exactly here. Sounds like uh, he kind of saw himself most of the way here. I want to, I was going to ask him about C.J. Abrams too. I was going to let it, I was going to let him go there. But uh, I want to go back to my question about the Boston outfield. I, I kind of I kind of cut you off in the middle there. Sorry about that. We just had someone pop on. But uh, how do you feel about that? Because I think it's an, it's an outfield that like there could be some value there. I'm just trying to figure out where it's going to end up. I, I saw a couple quotes like you know, will your Braves are starter and right, and then. You know, Rafael seems like it's a home run every other game. But uh, are there any guys you like? Uh, what do you feel about the Red Sox outfield? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do like Duran. I actually have him on a couple teams. Um, I really liked, you know, that uh, Cora mentioned he was going to be the leadoff hitter um, for the team uh, early on in spring training. So that gave me some confidence that we were going to see quite a few plate appearances. Of course, like two weeks later or a week later after I had drafted him on two of my Champions League qualifiers, actually. Uh, my DC and my OC there, he has like the toe injury and he was like, oh, this is going to bother me all season long. Um, so I really think it depends on the draft. I mean, I think um, uh, Tyler O'Neill, I think is going to get run there as long as he can play, uh, as long as he can be healthy, right? Like we know that when he's healthy, he's not only a, like an offensive force, but he's been good defensively as well. He's a former gold glove winner. So I think the health is going to be the factor there. And obviously he's already missed some time in spring training. Um, with some health related issues. And then I think you get into defense. I think both Abreu and Rafaela, I think are, are known for being really good defenders. Um, when I put um, Abreu at 600 plate appearances, um, I think he shows up pretty well. Um, you know, not like great, but like, I think he's a, he's around like 250 or so, which you may be like, Oh, that's nothing. But in a 450 person draft, like this one is, you know, that can definitely be some, um, uh, some value um, that people are uh, Willie Abreu is player 243. Um, yeah. When I put him in for 600 plate appearances, he's got the batting average. I think he's got a little bit of speed. Um, Rafaela, I haven't done the same exercise. Maybe I will um, uh, when I pass the mic over, but um, you know, I think both of them were really interesting when they played last year, right? I yeah. think they both didn't look overmatched. So there's definitely the possibility. I think it's one of those situations where, you know, like in a, in my OC, I got O'Neal because I want to get a high upside guy who maybe can blow up. But um, if he's not there, I don't feel as bad about dropping him uh, in a 15 team, or maybe I'm looking more at a Brayu, or I'm looking at Raphael and I'm hoping that there's an injury to O'Neal that frees up a spot and they get that everyday playing time, or, you know, they perform really well from the, from the get go and they kind of earn that spot. So I think that's kind of how my approach might shift a little bit in 12s and 15s. But I do think that Duran is a good pick as long as you're not concerned about that, you know, toe injury that he's got. Yeah. I, I really like Abreu. I, I'm looking at uh, main event AP, obviously get only five main events, but didn't get drafted in two of them. And AP was 419. So like, I just think that's a spot where 
he doesn't work out or he doesn't make the team or, you know, you, you need the spot really quick. Like that's an easy drop. It doesn't hurt you there. You take him in round 26 or whatever it is, but you know, someone that uh, showed some speed in the, in the Astro system in 2022 showed some power last year with Boston. And like you mentioned, you know, I, I know it was only 76 plate appearances in the, in the major or it was 85 plate appearances in the majors. So, you know, you can't take too much from that, but still 49% hard hit, right? Like that, he, he was not overmatched as you said, like he showed, Everything he needed to show uh, in that small little spurt, and I, you know, I like that. There's a lot of guys that look terrible when they first come up. Granted, he, you know, he struck out a bunch, 27 percent strikeout rate, but man, I think it's it's almost a free pick that uh, that I do really like. Uh, Abreu is someone that kind of in the end game as we're getting near the end, uh, someone I find myself clicking on a bunch. Yeah, and I think that it was pitcher list. Um, Kyle Bland, I think it was, was doing a little bit of an analysis on um, Abreu, or no, it wasn't. It was, um, oh gosh, what's his name? Um, uh, TJ, TJ skills, I think is the, is the handle. I'll have to look it up. So I make okay. sure I give credit, but was looking at, um, uh, plate discipline and, and swing choices and said, Abreu has been elite throughout his career. So that really gives him that solid foundation of good decision-making that I think it, yeah, TJ stats is, is, is who it is. I just, um, I just, I just, I uh, just searched for TJ skills and was not getting what, what we're yeah. looking for. <laughs> I, apologies for anybody who looks up TJ skills and may find something that they were not looking for. Uh, it's I, at I TJ stats. Thank you, Yancey Eaton. Hello, Yancey. Um, uh, who asked previously, this is just water. It's not whiskey. I'm, I'm drinking some water and ice. So uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm pretty boring. Well, you know, that's all right. We're you're, you're podcasting and, and breaking down a draft. Like we need you of, of sound mind here anyway. So we're good. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the um, the CLQ, the Champions League qualifier. While we're on a break here, uh, I, I don't know if you want any more people. I think you're probably tired of um, introducing okay. people on Twitter. But give us three uh, more give us, people. Give us ninety seconds on what the what the CLQ is that you have. Uh, I'm, I'm just saying you come up you come up with. I know a bunch of people that had the idea, but uh, give us uh, ninety seconds of that for anybody who there's a lot of people watching right now. Believe it or not, so uh, you know, sell us real quick. Uh, what is it? How do you join? And uh, what's kind of the, the upside of it uh, this year? It's it's a fun little setup. Yeah, for sure. Um, so the Champions League qualifier, the idea is, um, you know, there's a lot of different events that take place and there's different price points in order to get into them. And one of the things that I thought would be really interesting is there's no there's no event that's like just about how you perform, right? Where you earn your way into the event. And so the idea was to ch- create a Champions League qualifier and it's a combination of three contests at one OC, uh, one main event, um, and one draft champions league. And Damn. obviously like, you know, the price point is still, yeah, I know. Right. Like having to do a DC, I was totally out on DCs and OCs I was too. before oh. the NFBC gave me the thumbs up on, on, uh, on this, on this thing. So, um, I should yeah. probably, I should probably check mine. We're in round 42. I hope I'm not up right now. Uh, oh God. Um, I would love to know who you're choosing in round, uh, 42 here, Scott. I'm, I'm on the edge of my seat. I, I just went, I uh, just went Luis Gill in New, in New York. Looked Ooh, good again today. I liked I, uh, it. I, I like saw a 99 it. mile an hour uh, kind of up fastball upstairs from uh, from uh, uh, pitching ninja, and I was like, I'm in round 42. Mike get the fi- Mike get the fifth job in New York for sure. I think he had nine whiffs today on like yeah. 50 pitches, something like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's funny, you know. We always like, you know, don't pay attention to the to the gifts, don't draft that. But in round 42, like, give me someone that has a good gift. Dude, I'm, I'm in. Lean into the gifts in yeah. round 42. That's actually like what I call my gif range of the draft, where I'm just like, yeah, looking up the nastiest gif I can possibly yeah. look up, and then I'm drafting that guy. Yeah, uh, I took, no, I for took sure. someone named uh, 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 Hurston Waldron. Is that a, Waldrop? Is that a name in Atlanta? Yeah, I was like, yeah, yeah. I, Atlanta, Atlanta, Atlanta. Prospect, yeah, yeah, yeah. but like Atlanta. great name. Like, let's do it. Yeah, we're. Uh, it's it's so funny because you're like it's crazy thing is like there's gonna be some guys down here that really like win leagues for people in DC. And it's just like it's so funny that to realize that we are not even close to being able to figure out who that is. But there's gonna be some ones down there. But sorry, go on the CLQ. Keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, totally. So it's three contests and OC, which is a twelve team league. Fab League. It's a 15. Um, uh, there's a 15 team uh, DC draft champions, which is yep. the 50 round draft and hold. And then there's a main event. So the price point is still you know high, but you add on a $250 um, fee to that, which is called a Champions League qualifier fee. And it essentially ends you enters you into an overall with other people who are who put that fee in. You have a league that is designated for each one of those contests as your CLQ or your Champions League qualifier. And then the 30 categories, so five by five in all three leagues, go up against every other CLQ team. We have 197 right now, so we need three more to get to 200. So uh, well, please, we're, we're, we're going to two, we're going to 200 right now, Toby. This is your, oh, your, we've right got now. this is it. 
Yeah. And so, so everybody goes in and you compete in an overall contest across those 30 categories with everybody else. And that is 197 and the top 15 qualify the following year for the champions league, which is going to be a 15 team auction draft live in Las Vegas. You have um, to show, have to show up in person. You, you, you have to show up in person, although we'll have flexibility, right? Emergencies right. happen. Yes. It costs money to get there. So, yeah. you know, we want the best 15 teams to be there, but hopefully everybody will be there in person. And when they're there, we'll have, you know, live stream, we'll have coverage. It'll be fantastic. There will be podcasts leading up to it. But the idea, uh, so that $250 goes towards the pot. So if we get 200 teams in it, three more teams, it'll be a $50,000 pot with 60% going to the winner. So $30,000 will go to the winner. So you're entering 250 extra dollars from contests you were already doing, and you have the chance to win $30,000 for first place. And it's not based on being able to afford a really high entry into the league. It's based on your performance every single year. And then the next year, you'll have the Champions League going on at the same time as the qualifiers. And then the yeah. next time the champion of the Champions League will automatically qualify in the next 14 teams. Okay, so there's only 14. So if you win the Champions League, you automatically qualify. You automatically year. qualify the next year. I love it. Year. Yeah. And it so, is such a cool setup. And it's such a fun setup that it actually made me do a DC. Like that That should speak in itself right there. Like there's no way I'm dropping a DC if not for that. It's for people out there, the DC is a great format. People, people love it. I just don't have the patience for it. It's just a me thing. Strictly a me thing. But the fact that it's just such a cool setup. Whoever, you guys coming up with that idea – um, it's fun. I love the fact that, you know, someone with a little extra money can can enter into a league where you win 30 grand for winning the league. Like it's just a, uh, it's a really fun setup. Uh, and then you have to, you have to name your CLQ. Like if you have five main event teams, you have to name your CLQ team before you draft. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. You don't get yeah. to choose your favorite team right. that you drafted, right? Yeah. It's, you only get one shot, you know, yeah. it's like, like Eminem. That. You only get one shot. Do not nice. miss your chance to yeah. blow up. No, uh, you know? no mom's, no mom's spaghetti here. No mom's spaghetti here. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta, you gotta be in it to win it. So um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's really fun. I think it's going to add a totally new dimension to the leagues because you're going to be looking at your individual leagues. You're going to be looking at the overall competitions in the NFPC, but you're also going to be tracking, you know, the champions league, right. And that yep. sweat down the stretch you know there's going to be like three Ks between team 16 and team 15 yep. in the standings, like going down the stretch. And I think it'll also help out the other leagues because it'll make sure that people stay in those leagues longer, yeah. right? So even if you're struggling, you're trying to do as best as you can so that your CLQ still has a shot to right. qualify, right? Because you yeah, could have a team that... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was saying, if you're like sixth in your online championship league, but you're like doing really well in the main event at DC, like suddenly you're 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 making moves in that in a, in a lot of championships to gain ex- any point you can. Like it just whereas you may have you may have shut that team down. Like if it's September twelfth and you're sixth in your online championship, and there's two teams that really good can't catch them. You're like, oh, I'm not going to put effort into the fab, but you are where you are with this thing for sure, for sure. And then when the league actually happens, like the auction itself will be really fantastic. But oh, yeah. you think about like you know, the analysis that's going to happen of fab in that league, right? You have 15 teams that by sheer, like out of 200 were the best across three different formats. You know, they're going to be skilled players who earned it. And you can look at the fab and you can analyze the fab and you can look at the auction, like digesting that, like it's going to be really, really fun. It it is a really cool setup. I'm really glad you guys did it. That uh, so with the Champions League auction, will that be like the Sunday in Vegas, or what's uh, what's going to go on there? I think it's going to actually end up being the Friday night. Oh, I think it's going to actually be on Friday night, and we were okay. thinking thinking it would be Sunday night to be at the end. But there's a lot of our our East Coast friends, especially who will leave on Sunday to get back to work on Monday. Yep. So it was a little bit more challenging to do it that way. And I think there's also um, historically. Uh, Friday night has been the night with the fewest like big high stakes leagues. Right. And okay. so it, it seemed like the most, uh, the best fit. So I think that's the plan right now. All right. Well, if I'm not in it, you guys want me to, uh, to do any work on it or live stream or do anything like that. You let me know I'm in. Uh, hopefully I'm not available because I'll be in it. But uh, if, sure. if not, uh, if not, I'm willing to do whatever you guys want. I think it's a great setup. Yeah, for sure. No doubt you'll be in it, Scott. No doubt. Well, uh, you haven't seen me draft DCs before, so uh, yeah, be careful dude, with that. Dude, you just drafted <laughs> Luis Gill. That's true, um, and uh, and Waldrop from Atlanta. And, and Waldrop, like, yeah. I mean, if I that, like, I mean, you're you're set. Like, you don't even have to draft your last seven rounds, really. 
So we are we are back drafting here. The eleventh round just started. I think uh, Toby and I are going to go till uh, the next break. I think we're going to go. Uh, we we agreed to uh, do the first. I think twenty rounds or so. Are you you're good to stick for a little bit here? Oh yeah, let's do it. This is fun. This is it fun. Is. Like fantasy baseball needs more play by play. I mean, it's, honestly, like like that crazy. is that is why why I created the like why we created the Champions League, right? Yeah. Is because like having that live stream draft, right? Generating awesome. that attention. You're going to yeah. have personalities, right? We got personalities in this game. We got, oh, yeah. we got like the robot, right? Phil Dusso, like, right? Like we've got like um, other people in the industry who have these reputations, like yep. the guilds, right? Can you yep. imagine like comparing like the guilds in there, like to Phil, like they're different approaches to drafting, they're different approaches Beautiful. to life. Like that's going to be amazing. So before we do uh, get rolling here on the uh, the second part of this, I do have a couple of notes from our sponsors real quick. Uh, Fantrax. Fantrax is the most customizable fantasy platform in the industry, offering the greatest fantasy experience for your dynasty keeper, redraft, and best ball leagues. Coming from another service, Fantrax makes that easy as well. Fantrax can import any of your current leagues and customize as needed. Fantrax offers the most in-depth player pool in the industry, including minor league players. Do you need a customizable commissioner service for your fantasy league? Fantrax offers that as well. You, could do, uh, you can customize your waivers, your categories you play with, your scoring system, your schedule. Fantrax offers customized solutions for all that more, and it's all for free. Sign up for free today and be entered to win an official Major League Baseball signed jersey from Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Simply go to Fantrax.com slash Rotowire and sign up today. That's F-A-N-T-R-A-X dot com slash Rotowire. Fantrax, the home of fantasy sports. We're also sponsored by Rival Fantasy. We appreciate them as well. It's officially fantasy baseball season. It's time for MLB Best Ball on Rival Fantasy. That's right. Rival Fantasy now has Best Ball Full season lobbies are live now until opening day with both fast and slow drafts. Then weekly and daily drafts will be available from opening day through the end of the World Series. Best ball is all the fun of the draft without the in-season management. Enter a league, draft your squad, and the app does all the rest. No need to set your lineup or make waiver moves. The highest scores at the end of the regular season will all be the winners. Invite your friends to start drafting for the 2024 baseball, fantasy baseball season today. Sign up at joinrival.com slash rotowire. If you do that, you'll get a $200 deposit match and $25 in free entries. Welcome to Future Fantasy Sports. Welcome to Rival Fantasy. So, Toby, we're in the mid rounds here. We're at uh, we're in round eleven. People are picking. We're uh, we're st- we're starting to get some hitters. Only one, only two pitchers so far in the first nine picks. Uh, you know, as people start to realize they got a lot of pitching, need some hitting. Talk to me about the uh, the middle rounds here. I think it's always uh, for me like rounds eight through sixteen, eight through fifteen is like where the draft is won. Like when I look at leagues, I'm like, oh, look how well that guy did in rounds 10, 11, 12, 13. Like it's just these middle rounds. You get guys that really contribute uh, players that really step up. Are you, are you trying to like, you, you know, fix your balance? If it's a little bit off, are you trying to make sure you have the positions filled? Are you just like, I want the best player of the spot. Talk to me about rounds, you know, 11 through 15. Like what's, what's your goal here? And like, were you thinking like strategy wise? Yeah. I mean, I think I agree with you. Like a lot of times I'm catching up on hitting in this spot in the draft. Yeah. And I think a lot of times I'm hoping that I built a pretty, solid base so that I can be flexible and going after perceived values, right? Guys that, that I see are either following that, you know, maybe I have higher up on my board or guys who I think are mispriced to begin with. And so I really see, like you mentioned before, where this is the spot where there aren't a lot of guys early in drafts that are really mispriced, right? The market, I mean, the market generally does a really good job of of setting values for players, but there are certain biases that we have like recency bias or, um, you know, whatever it's called when, you know, you really love every rookie who comes up every year that has any hype around them. Um, so there's always those players. So I really think this is the spot where you see some guys that are mispriced by maybe 50 picks, you know, where you can really, um, well, 50s maybe a little high, but like 30 picks. Okay. Um, yeah, a couple, you know, a couple like, rounds. Like a couple oh, rounds. I, I, I'll yeah. get guys here that I'm like, I think he's a 11th round pick him a third. Like, I do, I, I have a lot of those. I think 30 is a pretty good number for that. Yeah, for sure. And so yeah. that's where I'm really trying to do that, right? Because I think this is the spot where you're getting those players instead of getting that, you know, maybe guy who has a little bit more variance and, and has a little bit more risk um, that that guy, um, uh, you know, has, um, you know, instead of getting that guy, you're going for somebody who maybe has been doing it for a long time. So isn't as, as sexy as the other guy, but you know, you can count on those plate appearances, you know, you can count, count on those runs in RBI. And so it fills in really right. Nice with the base that you've gotten because you already have that solid base. So you don't necessarily need that flashy, you know, player to come in and, and, and save your team, if you will. So what point in the draft is it in here is a little bit later where you're kind of like, uh, I'm throwing ADP at the window. I know that 
I'm not drafting by ADP, but you always have to look at it to know, like, do I need to take this guy this early? Like, how early do I need to take somebody? Are you are you still looking at that in rounds 11, 12? Like, I usually I, I cross off an ADP list in addition to my player list just to kind of make sure I'm not obviously missing someone that, uh, like, where – how did I not realize, like, I was still available? I never want to do that. Um, I usually go through, like, round 15 before I just toss that sheet aside because it's kind of irrelevant to me at that point. Uh, where are you at the point where ADP doesn't even matter anymore and you need to, you need to figure out what your team needs? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, a- ADP is a great tool. Like it's a yeah. super valuable tool. It's one of those things that I always am aware of and updating and keeping a, a value and market trends. I think it's all like, you know, in, in some ways it's, it's, it's both, uh, it's, it's quantitative, but it's also feel in the sense that like, there are certain players that I want to get on my team. Right. right. And because they're going later in drafts. And so my question is just a one of risk, right? What is the percentage chance that I think that this guy's going to be drafted in this round? He typically goes in round 25. I've seen him go as high as round 23. Yeah. Am I going to jump? Am I going to get him at round 22 and feel like 98% sure that I'm going to get him? Or am I comfortable waiting that next round and being 80% or 90% sure that I'm going to get them? So it really gets that kind of feel. And then you have to kind of balance that with, oh, I really wanted this guy. Like emotionally, I'm like yep. invested in this player because I see yep. him as the late round guy versus, oh, this guy has fallen or he's not generally available here. And actually in my ranks, I have him higher than this guy. So which one would I rather pick in this particular instance? So I think it's always, you always have to be kind of open-minded and you have to approach it in different ways. And then we're also human. So that emotional component is also like, how sad are you going to be if you miss out on this guy (laughs) and kicking yourself if they end up blowing up that year like you thought they were going to do? Yeah, I think I get to the point in most of my drafts where... um, at least in, around, in, the, in the 20s, I'm like, I'm just going to take him because I the, the 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 pain of losing someone like that because you took whatever, your middle infielder or your eighth starter or whatever it is. Like, I, I've done that too many times where I'm like, oh, I could push this guy two more rounds. And then randomly, the other guy next to me is like, oh, I like that guy too. I mean, we're not, we're not, we're not breaking it. Every, not everything, not everything was like a finding gems. Like, there are people that do the same work and are, you know, finding the same guys we do. So I'm almost at, after like round 16, 17, 18, I'm like, I'm just taking the guys that I want to take and I'm not trying to push too much. Sometimes you need someone and you're like, you know, this player's here and I got to do it. But along those lines, um, you know, in the first 10 rounds, uh, what, what do you do with someone that like, oh, this guy's fallen two rounds after ADP, so we're talking about ADP, but it's not someone I really targeted or wanted. Where do you kind of fall with that? Like, is there a point where you're like, I still don't want this guy? Or is there a point where you will take him? Because um, I feel like the, oh, uh, I had to take him because he went so far past ADP picks never work out. But uh, that's probably just, you know, remembering the ones that didn't. But where do you fall on that? Where, like, if you really don't like somebody, uh, are you still willing to take him if they get to the to the right place? Yeah, I mean, I think it all depends on what you feel about that guy, right? Like, you should never take a player that you actually don't think is going to be very good. And I actually think right. that's one of the things that's really helpful about spreadsheets and projections, right? Because yeah. I could have a guy who's fallen three rounds and I can look at my spreadsheet and say, well, I have this player as player 75 and I have, you know, the other person who's available as player 74. So yes, is the, is the, is the, is the mark, the market was off on this guy and now right. he's just going where he should go. And so I think that's the thing. Now, that's the, one of the things that I've really tried to hone in on is being happy with the picks that I'm making. Like that's not just, feeling like, I, like if I'm I could just, if it. I could just, take one clip from this thing and do that. It would be it, it, that it right there. Cause like, I think you, there's so many times and if you're not happy, you're like, what do you do? You're, you're here for fun. You're here to draft, but you also take guys that you think are going to be good and that you want to take. And uh, I have fallen victim to the, I don't really like this guy. I don't really want this guy, but my God, it's 30 picks back ADP. Like everybody else must know something that I don't. And I just don't want to do that. Like I know some of us pick where we're some of us. I don't, but like, I want to draft the guys that I worked hard and researched on and figured out. I liked, and I'm going to go with that. Yeah. Yeah, totally. That that's that for me is is kind of the way is the way to approach it. Like there are parts of the draft where like kind of like ah, I don't really love the hitters here. I don't really love the pitchers here. And honestly, my spreadsheet's telling me there's not a lot of value. Yeah. And if I'm in that type of a bind, then I'm like, you want to know something? Like I really like this player, and this may yep. be early, but like one of the things that I was going to say is, as you get deeper in draft, there really is a very little difference between the players. You know, right. so like player um you know player 103 on my draft sheet is like $15 right okay and player 118 is $13 okay right so there's a $2 difference and you might be like oh like that's a decent amount but it's like 
honestly, like that's like four home runs. Yeah. You know, like that's, that's a couple, that's a couple balls, that, couple right? balls hitting the foul pole or not hitting the foul pole. Sort of it, it's yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so, and then you get later on in the draft. Right. And then, it, then you've got like, you know, like first all my $7 players, I have like players from player 194 all the way to 219. They're all $7 players. That's wild. Right. Yeah. When you look at it that so way, that's crazy. Yeah. So it's just like, why am I going to draft this guy? Who's 785, who I who I have bad feelings about, instead of this guy who's seven dollars and ten cents. Like that doesn't make sense. That's not what it's designed right. to do. And I think thinking about it in that perspective and recognizing that jumping a guy at one pick 190, who's going, you know, at, at pick 250, the difference between pick 250, 250 is like a five dollar and thirty cent pick, right. and 190 is like a $7.92 pick, right? So you're talking about two and a half dollars worth of value, which again, is nothing. It's the difference right. between Bobby Witt and Julio Rodriguez, right? right. Like, that's it. Yeah, I think it's a good point. Because I, like I said before, like if you, at that, I get to the point, I think it's probably around round 15, where I'm like, I'm just kind of figuring out my team, figuring out what I need. And I just, I don't worry about where they were taking. I mean, obviously I'm not gonna take a guy that, He's going 460. I'm not going to take him in the 16th round because I don't need to. But, you know, as you get kind of in those margins get smaller, I think that you just want to you, – you, you've worked hard on this. You've, you've, you know who you like. Like, you know, live with who you like. I, I can always I can always be fine losing with uh, with, with my research and, and you know, losing with who I like. Then I, I, if I lose with someone like – oh, I took him because he just fell past ADP. But, uh, yeah, it's always interesting because I think people – there's like this weird thing of like ADP sucks and you shouldn't use it. Like, you have to. You have to. It's such a valuable tool, oh, as you said before. Tool. It's a huge deal. I mean, you just don't want to, you never want to jump somebody, you know, seven rounds when you could jump them two rounds. Like you, you get your guy, but just get him in a spot where you're going to get him, but you're not passing up someone that, that's really good. But uh, we just yeah. had a, uh, we just had a closer. I wanted to ask you about taking in the yeah. 12th round, uh, second half of the 12th round, Mason Miller for my, uh, my former Oakland A's, uh, you know, I, I guess they're still Oakland for one more year. Uh, he's a fascinating case. He can throw, he throws about 102 miles an hour. The, the A's have moved him from a starter role to a bullpen role, you know, kind of admitting that this probably guy's probably never going to stay healthy as a starter. It's kind of what it comes down to. His stuff is nasty. Let's figure out how we can use him best. He's moving to reliever role. He's been really good in spring. Kind of, if you, if you read the tea leaves a little bit, the quotes from Mark Kotze, like, I think Kotze really wants him to be the closer if they can get him there. Um, but, um, Quote, real quick before I get to that, uh, Paul Spore in the chat mentioned names on a board. Everybody agreed to have their names on the board, Paul. We we agreed this, this they were allowed to do that. So uh, that, no no capital offenses here. But uh, Toby, where do you fall on uh, on Mason Miller? Yeah, you know I haven't really uh, I haven't really had him on my radar. Um, he's uh, uh, he's, mo he's, mo he's moving up. Like, he's moving up too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. I, I know I have him on here somewhere. Um, oh, what is have he? him on here somewhere is not a not a ring endorsement. Yeah, no, I mean, I have him at I have him at one nineteen. Um, he's ranked one nineteen based on fifty nine. Uh, Is that six, what, one nineteen just pitchers? Yeah, no, that's that's everybody, right? So he's a huge value, but the question is, right? If you already have two closers by that point in time, yep. is he the guy you want? Right? Like you're using a pretty high draft capital pick on a guy who you're assuming is the closer, maybe, right. you know, like I haven't seen anything definitive on a team that last year got like, I don't know what, like 25 save opportunities and is probably going to be worse this year. Like all of those things just make it a little bit less appealing, but I can definitely see where it could also be interesting because he's, he could be absolutely like, he could be a Yoan Duran, right? Yeah. Like he could be that guy who's got fantastic ratios, really nice K's. You know, you know, last year we thought Duran was only going to get like, you know, 15 saves or whatever right. it is. That's why I was going later on. So you never know, but I'm usually got two closers by this point in time. And so I'm not really looking in that direction. So what if you are through 10 rounds and you have one closer? You know, there, there are only a certain number of closers that have jobs. There are 15 teams in this league. Not everybody's going to have two closers going to the 11th, 12th round. Is he someone you'd be willing to take a shot at as your, um, as your closer too, if you, if you need one in this spot? Maybe, I, I don't know. I, you know, like uh, Roberto Suarez went relatively recently to, I think, or Robert yeah, Suarez. He did, well, um, two, two picks after Mason Miller in the 12th round. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I'd probably lean more in that direction because like the fact is like 80th percentile is I think 73 saves in a main event. Um, so in a 15 teamer, it's about that. 
And so if that's the case and you're projecting, you know, Miller for 10 to 15 saves, right? You're really, you still need a full closer in addition to yeah. the guy that you already drafted. And so I'd rather be in a spot where I've drafted 60 saves or what I believe is 60 saves. And then I've got to add 15 over the course of the year instead of really still having to draft a full-time closer. Part of it is just the opportunity cost too with fab. Like, you know, one thing that I found myself with is specking a lot on my closer too, and then not, not having it work out and then spending so right. much time, energy and, and fab trying to get that second guy. Right. You know, and then there's two opportunities on the waiver wire and everybody's bidding 300 bucks and you don't want yeah. to spend your fab on that. Uh, that is very true. I've been in situations like that where you just, you know, even like early in the year, you know, like all my money is going to closers and it's, it's maddening. It's tough. And they just, like, everybody's like, Oh, just pick up the $3 closer. Like, yeah, but you picked up three already that, that didn't work out. That is the real problem in that situation. So uh, you are, you're really good with uh, pitchers. I want to ask you some guys in this range here. We've had, uh, we've had a couple of, uh, couple of closers or a couple of starters that I want to ask you about. Uh, Ryan Pepio moving from LA to Tampa got taken the 11th round uh, by Brian Bellinger, uh, Christian Javier, someone that I was massively hyped last year, had a, uh, had a rough year. He was taken also by Simon Hampton the, uh, uh, in the 11th round. And then uh, Cutter Crawford taken 13th round by Red Sox fan, Jody Ryan, obviously Crawford's a Red Sox uh, pitcher. Uh, what do you feel about those three guys? we got some young guys here kind of in different parts of their career. You know, Javier was the hyped guy. Pepio had the really good ratios last year, but really lucky. And then Cutter Crawford had the good finish of the year. Where do you fall on those, uh, those three guys, kind of a, a group of young pitchers here? Um, yeah. I mean, one of the things that people never do is, is highlight where projections were right. And projections did not like Christian Javier um, heading into last year. It's a, really, um, it's a really good point, by the way. And you're right. Like everybody points out where projections were like wrong. You missed on this. Like, yeah, you're, you're right. There are, there are times a lot of their predictions are good for a reason. Yeah. Although it depends on what your projections are. My projections didn't like him. So I stayed right. away from him. So I was lucky. And he was like, um, he, he was like middle of the third round with some drafts last year. Oh, right? for if sure. He was, he was, he was, yeah. he, was uh, he was two, he was, um, yeah. Like around pick 45, I think. Yeah. Okay. I never, I, I'm not good at the rounds. I think I remember the, like the numbers. Right. Um, but he was in that 40 to 50 range. Yeah, exactly. But this is the type of bounce back that you're, that you're, that you're kind of interested in, in the sense that he's going later on. So there's less of draft capital that you're putting into it. So I think a, a lot of it really depends on whether you think that he is, you know, that he's, that he's good or a target here. I think it also depends on your build. I'm oftentimes like skipping over this parts of the draft, not really interested in Pepio um, at all. You know, the projections don't like him. I think a lot of last year, what we saw successfully was luck. Obviously the Rays have a really good, um, uh, they have a really good track record of turning pitchers into kind of like the best versions of themselves. We saw it last year with Zach Eflin, where they like went out and really prioritized getting him paying, I think like the biggest contract they've given out to him. Um, and they obviously gave up a lot for Pepio. So I think they, they probably liked him a lot, but, um, I just haven't seen anything like, you know, either in spring training or even last year with what he was able to do. Um, Javier's going around pick, uh, his ADP in the main is 154. He's 193 on my board. So it hasn't really been a guy that I've been really interested or in looking at. Projections don't like Cutter Crawford, but he is the type of guy that I, I do like in the sense that like he's a guy going later on where you actually feel pretty confident about the whip at least, yeah. right? He's struggled with ERA. I think, you know, he doesn't have that velo necessarily, but um, he doesn't walk guys. He's got a really nice O swing. He's got those component parts of being a guy who can take the step to the next level. I think it's just a little bit of a question of velocity and his ability to beat people in the zone, um, which is keeping him from doing that. And whether or not he can kind of take that next step, I'm not sure. But even going where he's going right now with a solid whip, he looks to be solidly in that rotation now. I think they want him to be in that rotation. He's a guy that I that I have no problem going after. And I'm not surprised Jody Ryan got him here, right? right. A, Red Sox a diehard fan. Red Sox fan. Yeah. Um you know, but I, I, he, he of the three is the guy that I like the most and he's the guy who went latest in this draft. So that's uh that's not very fun. Cause I'm going to fully agree. I love Cutter Crawford. I mean, almost a 20% uh, K minus walk last year. I think it was 19%, but 12 and a half percent swing strike rate too. You talked about like missing, like he, he got a bunch of swing and miss. Like this is a really good number for a guy, uh, you know, kind of coming into his kind of coming to his first, first full season last year. Um, I love Crawford 13th round here. I think is a really good pick by Jody Ryan. Um, I agree with you. I take him over Javier 
over Pepio, over some other guys, the 11th, the 12th round here. You see some of the stars. Like I take him over um, Eduardo Rodriguez for sure. I take him over Savale. Um, I take him over Luis Severino. So there's a lot of guys that went before him. I really like Cutter Crawford this year, and now I'm probably not going to get him because everybody's going to hear that. But um, someone that's a, a big target for me in this range. Yeah, I mean, if he just duplicate, duplicated what he did last year, he had a 404 ERA, a 111 whip. I had him on pretty much all of my teams last year. I, I, I nice, liked him from nice. the get-go. I had him on a bunch of DCs too. Um, yeah, I mean, you kind of get him what you're getting. I have not drafted him yet because I think – this is always a really challenging round for me because of our conversation earlier where I oftentimes spend a decent amount of draft capital early on. Right. And so the challenge is like, how do I spend these picks on pitchers when this is where you get some pretty good values on hitters? So when you're doing your draft pep, are you like, you're like studying hitters even more intensively in this range then? Um, I mean, I think I'm like, I'm, I'm studying everyone like relatively equally, but I think that the values for hitters pop a little bit more here. Okay. And I feel like I can trust the projections for hitters in this range a little bit more than the pitchers. The pitchers that fall into this range are generally the ones who used to be good and maybe had a bad season or the guys where there's hype around them or who had a good end of the last season, right? And so it's a little bit harder to differentiate what can be consistently seen as good the projections honestly don't like a lot of these pitchers like with Crawford they don't like him right um and so you, uh, you, I mean you're the, you're more into that than I am do you have a do you have a feel why is there something he's missing that the projections don't like um I think that the just the by nature like they they are less um they don't adapt as quickly I think to new information because they do consider the last three years of data as opposed to um you know the more recent uh, okay. data which I think for, um, let me just see, like, so for instance, Cutter Crawford's ERA was 22.50 uh, in his first year in two innings, <laughs> but last year it was 547, right? And his whip was 142. And then last year it was better, but it's going to factor in. And so his, you know, like the steamer, which is the best projection system last year for hitter, for pitchers, has him as a, as a 468 ERA. Wow. And a 132 whip, right? And so part of the question is, is do you believe that? Right. And I don't really follow projections for pitchers as closely here because I think they fall into the categories you mentioned. Right. And like I said before, I want to go after a guy who's either been really good in the past and there was some excuse for why he wasn't good. Right. Um, or uh, who has shown me something in the last season that makes me encouraged that he can he can make that next step or make that jump up. So we've got uh, the last couple of rounds here. You talk about, you know, hitters and values here. Give me a couple of hitters that have been taken the last uh, couple of rounds here as you look at the board that you do really like. Not to, not um, to pull, put, you on the, put you on the spot like that, but no, yeah, no, no. look at these last couple of rounds. Who, who do you like here? Um, let's see. God, I've got to figure out. I can't see the, the numbers of the picks here. Um, guys that I like, uh, well, like the end of, end of round 12 was pick 180. So the, that's like 165 to 180 and then 180 to 195. Is yeah. Right. I mean, the challenge is always like, I have Jeremy Pena on a couple of teams. I got to do all the math for you, Toby. Yeah, I know. <laughs> my God. I like Jeremy Pena, but I've also like, you know, um, jumping him up here, I think in the main event, I don't know what was his, what's his ADP in the main event. Um, I think it's, I think it's later. It's two twenty five. Uh, it's two twenty five. So not not too much of a not too much of a difference there. Um, I like Pena there, although like you know again like the more you jump them up, right, the more of the value is taken away. Um, you know, so whereas he maybe he's like player one ninety, and if you get him at pick two twenty five, you're getting a you know a few dollars, but if you get him there, you're getting one dollar, right? So it's not a huge difference. So I like Pena there. Um, Pena's just since we're on Pena, Pena's weird like he was so good the year before and last year you know he had no home runs after the all-star break last yeah, year yeah that was wild when i saw that yeah yeah so. weird like he's like pulling a tim anderson on us like it's just crazy that they just he just kind of went away he was so good in that playoff run and so good as a rookie um you know i don't know if he's fully healthy or what happened but it was it was a strange year for pena yeah for sure for sure yeah it was strange um yeah, I mean, like, uh, let's see, Hoskins shows up really well, but there's a lot of first basemen that show up really well, honestly, like that are that are mispriced. And so, that's, I mean, that's that's good to know, though. Like, it's good to know where pockets of guys that you find as misplaced are. I mean, that's really valuable. Totally, yeah. Like, if you're looking for speed, Varsho, you know, in that spot is not a bad spot. Like, again, um, 
you know, not maybe a ton of value, but he has more of a balanced profile. If you can eat that batting average, if you built yeah. up a batting average cushion there. Uh, I don't mind. No, no, no catcher eligible this year, obviously, is the, the main factor while he's fallen so far down the board. Absolutely. Yeah. And like Luis Arias is interesting because he grades out really well. And you may be like, ah, oh, well, he's like kind of a one trick uh, pony, if you will. But like, if you look at what he provided last year, let me just pull it up. Um, it's not like he's a zero in other categories is what I'm trying to say. So he hit 354. Right. You're not going to project him for that, but like Steamer right. has him at 317. The bat X has him at, you know, 311, which is huge. He hit 10 homers, so it's double digit homers. Um, he had 71 runs, 69 RBI, and he had three steals. Right. So one of the things that you may want to think about is like maybe towards the back end of the year, if you replace him with somebody who maybe doesn't have the batting average, but can hit for a little pop and a little bit of speed, like that's a really good combo, right? Like you combine him with somebody with that type of profile and you kind of mix and match based on matchups, you can get yourself a really good player or you keep him in there. And if your batting average is way ahead later on in the season, you just kind of try to stream it. So the fact that he was able to get to double, double digit home runs, it's not like he's a zero there. So he's right. in some ways like a three and a half category contributor. If you consider a 0.5 in runs, RBI and home runs. So a couple of guys that have gone uh, in the last uh, round or so that I did want to ask you about, uh, where are you right now on Henry Davis? Uh, the, you know, soon to gain catcher eligibility uh, if, if for the Pirates, but only an outfielder at the moment. He was the number one overall pick in 2021. Obviously, the pedigree is huge. Uh, was called up last year, uh, hit uh, seven home runs in 255 plate appearances, not show a lot of pop, hit 213. Wasn't the best debut. Obviously, a lot of guys have that happen. Uh, where are you, Henry Davis? I've seen him on some some lists of like, I don't know how good he is. I've seen him on lists of like, this is a must draft. Uh, 14th round, uh, what say you on Henry Davis in Pittsburgh? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a, it's a risk for sure. There are things you like, right? This spring training performance, I think, has raised a lot of eyebrows. He went to driveline um, over the summer, you know, so he knows he's the type of guy that's really working on his craft and trying to be um, as good as possible. Um, I, I can't remember who it was. I think it was James Anderson on one of his podcasts was talking about that, where it's like, you know, you may not, you may not love a guy, but when you see them going to driveline, when you see them going to these places, what it does indicate to you is that they care, right. right. And that they are invested and they're trying to do that. So I think the thing with Henry Davis would be like, let's go and look at like what he's projected for. Right. So he's projected for right now. The bad X has him at 249, 14 homers, nine steals, over 479 plate appearances. And so the question becomes like, is he going to play every day and play catcher? Or if he catches, is that going to take away from his plate appearances, right? So if you think he gets to 600 plate appearances, right, then you're looking at more of like a 16, 17 and 11 or something like that. Yeah. So put that in your catcher spot. Like, how do you feel about that? What is that worth, right? It seems pretty good. Um, it assumes that he hits the projection, right? It assumes that he's able to make the adjustments, but it seems like a risk worth taking um, in some in some respects. But again, it, it's something where I'd like to pair him with a good catcher, you know, like maybe a good catcher one and have him as my catcher two instead of relying on him um, to fill but in. You're, the you're taking him like a strategy base wise. You're taking him here. You figure he's going to get a catcher eventually. So you just take a second catcher super late with the thought that you're just dropping that second catcher as soon as Henry Davis gets eligibility. Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I, mean, that's, I did that with Stephen Vote a few years ago and worked out really well. He was the he actually that was the one year he was really good. Um, new Guardians manager, by the way, just kind of wild makes you feel old. But yeah, the same kind of thing. Like if Davis was catcher eligible, he's a few rounds earlier. I mean, it's just one of those things. It's got to You got to think he gets there. Uh, like what, four, five, four weeks in something like that. Yeah. Yes. It's one of those draft picks where it doesn't feel good at the moment. Yes. But then immediately when he gets catcher eligibility, yeah. you're like, why the hell didn't I do this? Yeah, the second you the second you put uh, put him in the catcher spot, it's gonna feel so good. Um, oh, yeah. Garrett Cole, pick two seventeen is where we land. Uh, Dan Semsel, who is a former main event overall winner, he won the main event. Oh, God, 2012, 2013, something like that. It was uh, so good player has won the big prize. Uh, Garrett Cole goes two seventeen. There's a lot of questions about Cole earlier in the chat. Uh, there we are. We finally see with two seventeen. Uh, kind of right right around the range we uh, we kind of talked about. Yeah, exactly. I mean, again, it depends on what you want to do. And then you got to factor in, you're going to be keeping him on, on your bench for two months, um, probably at least. Um, and so you got to factor all of that in. And again, like you said, this is kind of the area where we had him going in right. um, if he was only throwing 100 innings. So um, somebody's going to take the risk and it's just a question of when. 
So that's a perfect segue to uh, what I want to ask you about you next. I have a couple of players, but I want to ask you, since you meant we talked about Cole, how are you on stashes? You are someone who's done very well in the main event. You do really well in, in contests like this where there's seven man benches. There are no IL spots. So this is the discussion that I want to, that I want to, those are the parameters I want to have discussion on stashes. So uh, injury stashes, minor league stashes. Are you, I can take one or two. I don't want any. I can take three or four and kind of figure out the rest of my roster. Where do you kind of come in with this? The thought that, you know, if Cole lasts around 20, we're not like going to suck it up and do it. But like, do you have a, do you have like a limit? Do you have a plan? Or do you hate them? Do you love them? Where do you kind of feel on, on, on injury and minor league stashes? Um, just, I, 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 one max, one max. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, it, t- it depends on your roster construction, but those spaces are tight. And the decisions are difficult and you need to be like, it's not just a question of like holding him on your bench. It's like, okay, my closer goes down and I need to spec on a closer, but it's like, I don't just want to spec on one closer because then it's like, I'm back the next week specking on the next closer for a hundred bucks, you know, or or 200 bucks or 300 bucks. So you're like, okay, well, I want to kind of like spread the risk. So I want to get three speculative closers or whatever it is. And then you're making decisions about like, you know, guys that you drafted around here who have started off slowly, you're like, you know, maybe not here, but like towards the back end of your draft who you really like, you're like, do I keep them or do I, do I not? And then like half the time you end up dropping the guy at some point in time. And then you watch somebody else pick them up and succeed. So I try to stay away from it, but it really depends on what the player is bringing for me. You know, like it's really, that's really what it is for me is like, how good do I think they're going to be when they come back? And how long do I have to stash them? I'm not going to pick a guy I'm going to have to stash for two months. Like, yeah. that's just probably not, at least a pitcher, you know, yeah. a hitter. And especially in, in the 15th round, like there's some, there's some good players you're, you're taking him instead of. Oh. Him. Yeah. I mean, one of the benefits of taking two closers early on too is like, you, you know, I used to go, my process used to be like, I'm going to take three speculative closers in, in these like, rounds 18 through whatever. And then you're like, wait a second, there are these good players that I really like that I really need to fill in my, my offense, right? Like there are 23 spots in a 15 team league. So Friday moves left. Yeah. Friday moves in the FBC have changed things too. Like you want to be able to move some guys in and out there, whether there's your guys getting two nasty lefties and he doesn't hit it. Well, like there's a lot of ways you go or you get randomly. He tweets his ankle. He's not gonna be out long, but he's going to not play Friday and Saturday. Like you, you want to be able to make a couple of those switches. I do a lot of Friday moves. I don't know. I've never looked at really like how the transactions lay themselves out, how I do it, but I am all, there's no, there's no Friday where I'm not at least looking to see if I have an advantage of making some, some offensive moves. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, the flexibility is golden Yeah, for sure. And you mentioned like the closing and waiting and stashing. Like, but the other thing is you're going to get other guys who get hurt too. Like you're going to have to hold other injured guys. So if you're starting with one, like you're going to get a couple more and, Suddenly you got to drop one of those injured guys. It gets it gets really tight really fast with a seven man bench. Yeah, I prefer it. By the way, I would prefer the this way rather than aisle spots. I actually like oh, the, yeah. I like the hard decisions. I like the not stashing twelve guys and the the waiver wire is is better with this. I, I actually like the rule. I know that it can you do get you you get the really extreme side injury luck can really suck, but uh, I prefer this uh, to, to aisle spots for sure. Oh, absolutely. I think, I think it ruined, uh, honestly, like for me having the IL spots really, really kind of ruins it, you know? Um, I do too. I agree. Uh, it's, it, it, I mean, you could, you could, you could definitely argue that, um, you know, there's more strategy involved, but it's just like, I remember the last time I had an IL league, you know, I would just like pick people up directly off the waiver wire and put them straight right. on my IL. Right. And I'd have cost you nothing. F- f- yeah. 15 guys on my IL that I'm like, it didn't take skill to do that. Right. It right. just took like, the memory to be like, Oh, this guy just got hurt. I'm going to throw him on my, you know, IL to just see if he comes back. Like I I really like the difficult decisions that it forces you. And imagine how sparse the wire would be so bad 15 team leagues. If you could, if you could hold for the IL. So, so we talked, uh, we talked at pick 75 about uh, hypey, buzzy Wyatt Langford uh, in, in, in round 14 to um, what's his first name? Uh, Simon Hampt, uh, Jackson Holiday, round 14, pick four of the 14th round. Uh, the other buzzy guy, but you know, it's, uh, it's buzzy in a way that like you can kind of stomach this price a little bit more. Obviously, we don't know fully if he's going to make the team. Uh, it's funny, we have two Jacksons, Jackson, Merrill, and Holiday that we're not totally sure. Um, Holiday's ADP is 190 in through five main event drafts. So a little bit, uh, 
I can't do the math now myself. I made fun of you about the, about this spot. Um, where are you with that uh, with Jackson Holiday? Someone you are thinking about taking? Someone that you're going to avoid? Uh, where do you what do you think about Holiday? You know, this is why we have spreadsheets, Scott, so that we don't have to do math, so that they do the math for us. I know. Um, uh, he hasn't even like really crossed my radar of taking okay. Jackson Holiday. Yeah, I mean, where he's going right now, like, you know, the projections have him. I think at for eight and eight. Um, in 475 oh, okay. plate appearances, you know, and there's plenty of guys that can provide similar um, production around I'd, this. Spot. I'd argue that, like, I think the stolen bases are more likely to be beneficial than the power. I don't think the power is quite there yet. And it's hard for me to take a guy who the power is not there at this price. Like, for round 14, like, we're still talking about really good players in there. And uh, it's fun. He looks great. The hype has been great this spring. We don't even know if he's going to start on the team or not. You know, they're kind of they've kind of built it so he could he could have a spot if he if he earns it. But you know, maybe they send him down for six weeks too. That's that a lot of teams that he's really really young. What is he? He's twenty. Is he twenty? He's twenty right now. Um, just turned twenty in December, so he's really young. Uh, I'm kind of with you. I think it'd be fun, but in the in the fourteenth round, I'm probably just not doing it. Yeah, totally. I mean, think about like his AAA numbers, right? He hit 267. I mean, granted, he's he's 20 years old, right? He was 19 yeah. probably when he was here. But like in 91 plate appearances, he hit two homers. Um, right. You know, if you combine his his AAA and his AA, you're looking at 250 plate appearances with five homers and four steals, you know? And so the competition level is going to be better than that, right? It's going to be more yeah. difficult theoretically, although he will... He will grow. He will get a little bit more power as he kind of matures. But uh, for me, it's just there's so many good players still going here, right? Like, and I, I always hear the same thing. It's like, well, he was only 19 last year. Well, yeah, he's only 20 this year, and he's gonna be facing major league pitching. Like, it's it's a tough game, and it, at 20, I just if it was round 23 and it'd be fun, I could do it. But around 14, I'm probably not the one pulling the trigger on him. Totally. Well, like, and it's just like, look at, look who's going around him, right? right? Like you have Jorge Soler, you know, 30 bombs. Alec Bohm, like had a career year last year, right? He hit like 300 with 97, 97 RBI. Steals. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. He's in a, he's on a really good team, right? You got Henry Davis, who we talked about the potential there for catcher. Anthony Rizzo, when healthy, is still hitting bombs. Stroman, before his injury, was electric last year. Eloy's batting average and power, you know, Candelario has a clear path to playing time, multi-position eligibility, like phenomenal, war, phenomenal, like, phenomenal part to hit guys, into, right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. And 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 we've seen them in the majors, so we know how they're going to respond. Yeah. And so maybe they have less of that upside. Although I'd argue that guys like Bohm, who are still young, Davis, Jimenez, Candelario, still have upside, right? But like, uh, I just can't. I just can't make it. I can't. I can't do that. Yeah. So in this uh, in this range, we get these two uh, utility only guys that have been high draft picks in the past: Byron Buxton and Eloy Jimenez. So kind of a double double part question here. How do you feel about utility only guys at this point? Is it someone that you're like, oh, I don't want to take this guy? You know, Marcelo Zuna went earlier. Obviously, you know, Shohei goes. Uh, Shohei went uh, in the first round, pick ten to Mike Mager. Uh, but what do you feel about uh, a utility only guys? But b particularly Buxton and Jimenez, guys who have been hyped in the past. You know, obviously Buxton's dealt with the injury. Eloy's dealt with injury too, but you know, someone that we thought it could be like a high power and high average guy, which you don't see very often. It's hard to find Buxton, you know, hits, hits the ball a ton is super fast, but can he put it all together? Can he stay healthy? He's going to play center field this year. Uh, round 15 Buxton and Eloy. Uh, what are you doing? Are you considering these two guys? Yeah. I mean, just before that, like major um, taking uh, Shohei. I mean, I, I just hate that guy. Major. You know, he's so good. <laughs> he is every good. single one of his draft picks, every yeah. single draft pick and every single draft that Mike Major makes, I'm like, I can't stand this guy. And I've got to go up against him this year. I, I'm annoyed. But um, very, anyways, very, very, very good player. Nice yeah, guy, too. Yeah, very nice guy. I'm, I'm of course, just kidding about the, the hatred of there. Course. Um, yeah. He's an incredible player. Um, Byron Buxton, um, Eloy Jimenez. I have Jimenez as a slight value where he's going. Like, okay. rank-wise, I have him around uh, pick 180. Um, Buxton, I have is slight, slightly negative. Um, again, I put a little bit more emphasis on batting average. So I think that really dings Buxton, um, the injury history. We obviously don't have to get into that for either, either one of the players. Right. Um, we know about it. Um, Eloy had a little bit of a dip last year in his, um, in his power, but the batting average has always been there. I was actually listening to, um, uh, the launch angle podcast with, uh, with Rob DiPietro and, and Rob Silver and Jeff Zimmerman. And they were talking about him yesterday and, and had some good points. Um, 
he had 18, 18 homers, 34 barrels, slight dip in his barrel rate. His career barrel rate is 12.2%. Last year it was 9.3. Doesn't make a ton of sense for me. Rob had, had, had a suggestion that maybe like he's selling out a little bit for, um, contact because his K rate, um, did go down, but, and his, uh, contact rate, um, went up considerably, but I, I just, um, you know, I think it's one of those kind of aberrations. So I do think Eloy's interesting for a batting average power combo there um, going later on. So of the two, I think I'd probably prefer um, Eloy. But um, again, I can see where people are kind of looking for upside in this range and can see that in both of them. Buxton may also get outfield eligibility. There's word of that. So yeah. Yeah, yeah I, it's funny because I'm at the point in round 15 where I'm I'm kind of willing to take a shot on either guy. I think that uh, you, could, you could see both their upsides. I know you had Buxton... Two years ago, like he like the latest pick in the main event, right? I think I remember this. That, I was did. That right? yeah. Oh, I remember that. I got him at yeah. like pick fifty eight, and there I was like, like, oh, there was like great. Yeah. Toby, was, you're so lucky. He was yeah. going like the two three turn, and I, he was so hyped. And all of a sudden, that one draft, like nobody took him. It was wild. I remember looking up that board and being like, I remember, I remember Jeff Harrison sitting next to me, took Will Smith instead, and I was like, you didn't consider Buxton? Like it was crazy. And like it turned out that uh, you know Buxton was uh, injured again, but. I think round 15 is like a time where with both Eli yeah. Bucks and like it, it, it's worth it. Like, I think that, uh, you know, it may not work. They may get hurt. You know, you could drop them. But around 15, like the upside is so, so real with both of those guys. Like you can see it with both of them. And Eli still hits the ball really hard. I know his hard hit rate was down last year, but still really, really good. Uh, UT only is going to stick with Eloy. I don't think he's going to play enough to outfield. To, you know, they, they just want him to hit. Uh, Buxton, you know, I think where he's a start there and it's, it only takes a week and a half for him to get out. So I think he'll get there. Who knows how long it'll last, but, uh, yeah, I do like both guys in this range and you know, that's a uh, coming off. I liked Eloy last year too. It didn't work out. Um, I would not take it Buxton last year, but I did take it, it did take Eloy and it didn't work out, but I think I'm back in at the price. Yeah. I mean, one of the challenges too, I think with filling your util here is, you know, like for me, I'm spending oftentimes a lot of draft capital early on on pitchers. And so I may be a little bit behind in speed or maybe a little bit right. behind in average or home runs. And if I'm not behind in home runs, it's not a problem. But if I'm looking for speed, it's really hard to fill your util. And I say that because like, when you think about the positions that provide you with speed, it's outfield, you know, shortstop, second base, middle infield on, on, uh, as well. And it's not yeah. a lot of spots, right? Especially later on in the draft, there's not a lot of speed in the outfield, you know, remaining. There's a couple like speed only guys that maybe you want to take a shot at later on, but there's just not a lot. And so if you fill up that util, it takes away with a guy that's going to get, you know, maybe with Buxton, you do get a little bit of speed, but you, you never really know with him. Um, but if you fill him up with like an Eloy guy, then that takes away one of those spots where you can get steals. Yep. And I oftentimes my, find myself looking at like an MI or a CI type of guy in that util spot right. that can get me a little bit of speed or batting average in that in that in that way. And you know that uh, team context and team build matters, and that's why you've got to be willing to be flexible in the draft. It's a really good point there too. It's just you know. You may you may like Eloy in that range, but it might just not work on your team. It just you can't you don't have to force it. Somebody asked earlier about JD Martinez in the utility uh, discussion. Uh, he's about uh, ADP is about pick three hundred, not signed yet, so he's he's a little bit later. I think once he gets signed, it's in a good spot. Um, you know, if he were signed, there's a couple spots I've heard talking about. I heard like Cincinnati would be that'd be huge. Um, you know, now that uh, they they have a little bit more openings there, but you know, I think that. Uh, you know, the risk of him not signing, maybe he didn't, I don't know if he's a comp pick guy. I forget if he's a comp pick guy or not, but you got to figure he's going to sign at some point, but we're at March 16th. The season's 10 days away. Like we've got these, uh, the Snell, Jordan Montgomery, JD Martinez um, types. Like it's concerning at this point. Yeah, um, it is. He, I picked, I picked up JD uh, Martinez in my OC, I think with like my last pick or my second to last pick. And this was a couple of weeks ago. So the idea was like, Hey, if he signs and he signs in a good place and he's playing right. every day, like that's going to be a fantastic yeah. hit, he was, right? He was really good last year. He was really good last yeah. year. Um, I have him right now projected for 505 plate appearances, pe player 292 um, rank wise. His ADP in the main events was, is 301 so far. Yeah. So they're going right about where he's going. This is the type of pick that I like to make like later on. In the draft, like, you know, depending on who's available around pick 300, maybe I make the pick. But like when it's towards the back end of the draft, it's one of those ones preseason where you can kind of cut bait if he's not signed or if he signs in a bad spot right. and he doesn't have every everyday plate appearances and you don't feel bad about it. But if, if it hits, it could hit pretty big. So I think it's just that kind of balance. I think in a 15-teamer, that's a lot more difficult than it is in an OC 
where, you know, the, you know, where you're looking for that guy who can really hit the upside. Right. Um, and make a difference. And, and he, we, we know that he could like, if he signed in Cincinnati and he was playing DH every day, like oh. 30 homers, like lock it in with a good right. batting average. Uh, so since we talked about Jackson holiday, the, uh, the, the number one pick from this year, Paul Skeens just went to uh, Scott Fleming, who we mentioned earlier, if you have people just joining in has won this league three years in a row, uh, end of the 17th round. That's uh pick two fifty five. Toby. What do you do with a pitcher like this? Who's obviously going to start the year in the minors. They're probably not going to throw him a ton, a ton of innings. I mean, they want to get him kind of stretched out and ramped up. Um, this feel too early for you. Is this a spot where you do you take someone like this? Obviously the stuff is nasty. Anybody that watched it knows that his stuff is real. He could be really good really quickly. He's one of the pirates best five starters now, but they're not going to do it that way. Uh, what do you do with it with guys like this? It's interesting because Victor Scott just went to another guy who might start the year. The minors might start the majors based on some injuries in St. Louis, but what do you do with someone like uh, like Skeens in your drafts coming up here next week? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think Scott is definitely starting in the minors. I saw some, I think it was in the most recent mining the news where they said they, they really feel like he needs more time. Um, so that's a little, it's a little early um, uh, not to be rude to whoever did that. Um, uh, but um, for Paul Skeens, um, you know, he's not actually projected to be all that phenomenal. Um, I think is the challenge like last year. Let me, let me just see. So last year he threw, um, so he only threw, oh, he only threw like, God, he only threw six innings because he was, he was in college. He was in college. Yeah. He was throwing a bunch. He was throwing a bunch at LSU. Yeah. So he's projected for like, you know, the, the biggest, the highest projected innings total he's got is 114 innings, you know, which is low. Um, and even within that projection, like he's, he's projected for 88 strikeouts and 114 innings. So the K rate isn't all that. Um, great. Um, so I just think like, I think there's really good players that are still on the board who are going to definitely be up. And again, like, I think you have to factor in all of the contextual factors, which each one of these picks, right? Like let's say Skeens, you know, what are the chances that he comes up right away? Right. So how long are you going to keep him on your bench? How long are you willing to keep him on your bench before you drop him? Um, if he does play, what are the chances that he's going to be good? And that's, um, a, and then, that's a big factor because pitching in the majors right away is difficult, even for the best of guys. There are a lot of guys oh, that come sure. up and do really well, but those guys get, get smoked really early. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Like, no, like no doubt at all. Like, um, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt at all. And then it's like, okay. And if he pitches and he pitches well, like what's his contextual factors, right? He's on the pirates yep. and I, I don't know how good they are defensively, honestly, but like, he's not going to get a lot of wins, right? Like he's not going to go deep into games. Yeah. No. Um, he's not going to, they don't have, I mean, they do have a decent bullpen now, like at least back into the bullpen. Um, I guess they got three guys that I really trust in that bullpen now. So they're fine. But like, you know, it's just things like that where you kind of run it through and you're like, ah, there's a lot of stuff that needs to go right for this to happen. Um, so I like to stay away from it. But again, I can see where people are looking for the upside this late in the draft and trying to identify it. But again, like we're in round 18. Like we still, you still have five more players until your 14 and your nine are filled up. Yep. Right. And so now you're going to round 24 before that happens. Right. Now because at this you, point, that's probably your fifth starter, sixth starter, someone there. Like that's someone yeah, that you want yeah. to use fairly regularly normally. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and yeah, so it's just a major question. And how many times have we seen like top prospects come up and just get, destroyed yep. right yep. like you know and so like with 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 scott's team and again he's won three in a row so you know and i love a, a lot of the picks that i'm seeing here like you know his his rotation is wheeler erod christopher sanchez jordan montgomery and Mackenzie gore right like those are his top five sps so paul Skeens is his is his is his number six right and so i think there's not a single one of those like the, probably the most known quantity, don't get me wrong, like I like some of these picks, right? Like I know Christopher Sanchez is a lot of people's pick to pop. Yeah. You know, Jordan Montgomery like has been good. He's probably the one that you know the most about or has been the most consistent. I, and I like the Mackenzie Gore pick myself. Yeah, I like the Mackenzie Gore yeah. pick too. I like it too, but like there's 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 a way that that goes bad. Right? Oh yeah, like, no doubt. Yeah, like- It has, it has like, gone bad already before, yes. Yes, and, and like the cha- the question isn't just like, for each player, right? Like we oftentimes look at each player individually and in the way that it works, but it's like, you take all of those players. What is the chance that one of them absolutely bombs? What's the chance that one, that one of them is absolutely good. 
And what is the chance that they hit their 50th median projection, right? So like with Mackenzie Gore, his median projection for steamer is 419 with a 134 whip. Like that's not good. No. Right? Like that's no. We know he's got struggles with command, right? And so, and so, okay, if he's not successful, then you don't keep him in your lineup, but where are you getting the next pitcher from, right? Paul Skeens is no long, is not up yet. So nope. he's a waiver wire guy or he's a round 20 guy, right? So it's just things like that where like, I really like to make sure that I'm having, you know, like, and, and of course there's risks everywhere, especially at this part of the draft, but th- that's just my thought process on it. Yeah. No, it's fun to hear you go th- kind of go through that thought process. Um, outfield here, I want to ask you about uh, Jose Siri uh, was someone that uh, was uh, a lot of smart people really liked as kind of a uh, a late pick last year, and weirdly, I think kind of worked. It was it's hard to tell if it worked or not. He hit two twenty two, but twenty five home runs, twelve stolen bases. He said in camp that he wants to run more. Um, what do you do with these guys down here that like, you know, have some power, have some speed, but batting average is so abysmal that it's just, it's kind of hard to stomach. Yeah. I mean, the problem with Siri it, for me is like, you know, I mean, maybe is he, is he supposed to play every single day? I mean, his defense is so good that uh, that helps. One of those guys that like defense is so good that it helps, but it's the race. So he's no, he's not gonna play every day. Yeah. I mean, like, although they have what, less, they have less like, platoon options than they used to like they don't have a they don't have a left-hander on the bench right now i guess jonathan aranda will play against righty so he's a dh but like there's no like obvious outfield platoon for siri like there has been in the past yeah and with deluca getting injured and stuff like that yeah i mean he's super he's interesting i mean i think the challenge is like the batting average it's a severe drain but i like going after a profile like he has versus maybe some of the other profiles that are low batting average here they're just like low batting average power, um, something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I haven't gotten him in any of my drafts and I think in my, my mental block was last year he had what 364 PA. I think he was getting kind of moved in and out of the lineup a little bit. And there wasn't necessarily a lot of like method to that madness. Um, and so I think it's always hard with guys that are on the Rays or the giants or folks like that. Like it's one thing to be like, Oh, this guy's in a platoon. But then it's like during the season, it's annoying as all heck, yeah. you know, because you're like, okay, I've got three games and he's missing one. Do it is especially true with the, with the Friday moves too. Like you get to Friday and you're like, all right, am I playing serious? Oh, he's sitting Friday. It's so tempting to just sit him because you know, you're like, you're at one, two games max. Maybe he plays one and a half games if he gets uh, you know subbed out or pinch hit for or whatever it may be for a platoon or a lefty. And it's just, it's hard with the, with the, with the bye week moves. It's really hard because you just, you, you, you tend to focus in on that first game a lot. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, so it's tough. It's tough. I, I don't like having those guys on my teams, honestly, um, especially for fab leagues, right. Where it's just like, it's another spot on your bench or that you need to have, you know, to be able to move in and out with him as well. So yeah, I, I, I'd, per, I'd, I'd prefer not to have a guy like that, but again, if he's playing every day, like there's definitely a lot of potential there. And like, I hear him about stealing a lot, stealing a lot of bases, honestly, like he had 12 and 364 plate appearances yeah. last year. So it's not like 30 is all that far off. The question is just health, yeah. all of those things that we have not seen from him yet. But like 25, 20 is suddenly in play. And then all of a sudden you're like, it's this 18th round. Like that sounds pretty darn good too. Yeah. I mean, that's why you pick him, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, we're going to jump out of here at the next break. We've been uh, going on for about uh, two hours and 20 minutes, so I don't want to take too much more of Toby's time. But talk to me about, a little bit about the end game here. We're getting down to the last rounds here. Are you just are you filling positions? Are you looking for your targets? How do you kind of feel about the last 10 rounds? I know we drop a lot of these guys, but when you look at successful teams, there's a, usually a, a pick or two uh, past round 20 that stuck on a team or, or broke out or did really well. I had a couple of years ago where – I did really well. I got Kyle Wright late and I had um, mm. Tony Gonsolin down here late, like both in the twenties. And they're just, they're, they're huge difference makers down here. How are you? Um, are you, do you study down here? Are you looking for specific, specific guys? Like how, tell me how you go uh, post round 20 real quick. Just like try to figure out uh, how to find some value from these spots. Oh, I study. Yeah. I study Good. like, like laser focused eyes That's on, what this, I on hear. this part of the draft. Um, yeah, I mean, the thing is like, this is, it's the end game, but it's like a core part of your team, right? Yes. I mean, we're talking about like, you still have four guys that are going to be in your starting lineup theoretically, like obviously like you, you can play things around. So I think like there's your, there's the core part of your team. And I think what you're still doing is you're still looking like, are there guys that are being undervalued by this particular draft? 
or that the market is undervaluing that I can grab here that I feel pretty confident about. Um, sometimes at this point in the draft, you can kind of think like strategically about different things where maybe you're like, okay, like I am going to draft Jose Siri, who's like power speed combo, but now I'm going to get like some guy like, you know, I'm just throwing somebody out there, Sal Freilich, who I think is going to have a high batting average. And then I can play them week to week on like the matchup that I think they're going to have. And that's going to be one outfield spot for me. Um, you could be taking speculative closers here, right? Guys who you think are either in, you know, high leverage spots or they have an anointed a closer and you think it might be that guy. A lot of times those guys will go earlier, right? Like I'm assuming like some of the Brewers guys have gone here in this draft already. And so if that's the case, then it's like, okay, well, like who is the least valuable of these guys so that I'm, I'm specking, but I'm specking and somebody who I can get in the 30th round instead of some guy who I have to get in the 20th round. Um, I may look at the upcoming schedule, right? Who's got a really good schedule for the first few weeks. And I feel like as a starting pitcher, they're going to have a couple good matchups and they could start off hot. And then from there, I can decide whether I want to keep them or not. Um, or else maybe it's just guys who are like, oh, they haven't made the team yet, but if they make the team, they're going to be in a really solid position. Or you know, just looking, this is where like that news and note stuff really comes into play where it's like, there are certain things that can change within this guy's, right. you know, external environment that can change his value significantly, either within the context of the entire player pool or on your team, right? Like, like, Hey, I'm really bad in batting average, you know, like I'm just making up somebody like Luis Arias is still available. He's not, right. he's already going to go, but a guy like that with that profile <clears throat> yep. is available later on. And you're like, Oh, I'm going to pick him up because he's valuable for my team specifically. So I think all of those teams go into play, but I think the mistake that people sometimes make is making it all specs or making yeah. it all risky picks and not thinking that, Oh, guess what? Like this could be a core function of your team. Like these could be core guys to your team. Um, and like just taking real, real kind of thought, like stretch picks in this area repeatedly, instead of still trying to get people that you think can make a difference on your team. Yeah. I think the, the mix and match is really the key there. And I, that's, that's what I really try and do is like, I, I want a couple of guys that are specs, a couple of guys that if I need to use them this first month, I can actually use them, which is very important. And we talked about, uh, Mike Mager's team always makes some good picks. He just got Tyler O'Neill 60 picks after uh, main event ADP. That was a uh, pretty nice one there in the 19th round. I know that he's got a little uh, banged upness right now, and he always does. But, uh, man, a pick that, in round 19, that's a pick that could just really, really work. It's amazing what being scratched the day of the draft will yep. do to somebody's value. Major, cut it out, dude. This is <laughs> this is outrageous. Uh Jordan Hicks just went in the 19th round moving. We talked about earlier about uh, Michael King moving from the uh, bullpen to the rotation. Do you have any faith that Jordan Hicks is going to work as a starter in San Francisco? Um, Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't really like have a strong feeling about it. I think there's a lot of things that are kind of stacked against him in terms of like innings volume. And he's never really been able to be a K guy, like even in the bullpen, except for maybe last year. And so I think there are things that are up against him, but he does have some things going for him, pitching for the Giants, you know, um, having a, what should be a really good infield def defense there as well. So those kind of things, I think, uh, like going for him. But um, I don't know. He hasn't he hasn't really been on there on there for me. Um, yeah, yeah I don't, I, it's hard for me to see it working. Yeah, for sure. I mean, one thing like, you know, just going back to Scott Fleming's team, you know, just being critical of the, a little bit of the, like the build from the starting pitching perspective, but like, you know, look at like Dean Kramer for me is like a perfect pick there where it's like, you know, Dean Kramer is not sexy, but if he, he's on a really good team in what's yep. now a good ballpark. Yep. And, you know, if he replicates what he did last year with like a low four ERA and a decent whip, like that's a, that's a solid, like that's the type of pitcher I think that, counteracts some of the maybe more risky picks up at the top. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. Obviously, Scott's a really good player. We talked about him a bunch in this in this, uh, in this this live stream. But, you know, if you're going to do schemes, maybe you do it. You have to do a guy like Kramer because you just, you know, he's going to start early. You know, he's not going to kill you. Probably going to be pretty solid. You know, not great, not super upside. And then maybe if schemes get called up, he moves into that spot and it kind of it kind of works together well. Uh, last question I'm going to ask you before we're going to jump out of here. The Boston rotation. Tanner Houck just went – uh, Garrett Whitlock went in round 17, Brian Bayo a couple rounds before that. Just about the Boston outfit. What do you think of the Boston rotation? It feels like an interesting uh, group here where a lot of talented guys that are going in the back half of the draft that you could see kind of breaking out, uh, you know, tough park to pitch in. But these are some names that like, as we, uh, as we maybe look uh, later in the year, we're like, you know, 
what uh, where did some young guys come up? Feels like Boston between those three guys plus Cutter Crawford. We talked about him already, but a few rounds earlier. Um, I kind of like all these arms on, the, on this on the squad. I don't know how they're going to work out or how they're going to piece themselves together, but uh, some interesting arms that uh, have some upside to them. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, they're they are definitely. Um, they're interesting. I haven't found myself getting any of them. Hauk is interesting to me. I think there were flashes last year. He was he was pretty bad down the stretch, honestly. But like there, he's shown flashes throughout his career where if he can get a third pitch that works for him, you know, he could maybe be a little bit more successful. I mean, one of the challenges is you're trying to stay away from guys that are going to totally blow up. Right. Um, Bayo, obviously, the Red Sox see a lot in him. Um, and and he had stretches last year where he was really good as well, but he also had stretches where he really struggled with his um, with his control, right? Like he had a really high walk rate. Um, and I think the challenge with the walk rate and one of the reasons why, you know, trying to roll out those low whip guys is, is especially with the ball jumping like it was last year, yeah. home runs an issue in the game. Like you're really trying to stay away from those really big um, innings. I'm going to take a look at Bayo here, like just really quickly because um, my memory does not serve me as well. Yeah, so like, yeah, like even like, let's say looking at Bayo's last 10 games, right? Like, you know, the end of last season, his in-zone contact was 89%. That's awful. Yeah. Uh, his K rate was 18.1%. That's awful. Like his walk rate was 7.2%. So luckily he like brought that down. Swinging strike rate was 9.7%. You know, like all of this is like kind of giving me, making me sick. Um, so again, like, you know, we're going to have to see some significant changes to what he was able to do, but his last five games, you know, it was up at 22.8% for K rate walk rate at 7.9%, you know, league average is like 14% K minus walk rate for starting pitchers. So he's about league average. Again, he's young. He could take that next step, but there's nothing in the profile that I like really, um, enjoy you about just, that. You just said it makes you sick, so that's probably not a yeah, good Yeah, yeah, I'm probably not um, going to get Bayo. I'm sorry. The, guy, the guy I like is Whitlock, and I know that some of it is from relief last year, but he's got a he's got almost a 20% K-mass walk. He's a 4.3% walk guy last year, and he was 48 the year before that. So this is like a real guy that does not walk guys. I know he's transitioning. Um, he started, I think, 10 games last year, but you know, most a bunch of his games were out of the bullpen. But 12.9% swinging strike rate is really interesting too. I know the home runs are an issue, but the Babbitt was 340 last year. Like he fixes that a little bit. Um, a lot of ground balls too. He's a 44% ground ball rate guy. You get the strikeouts, the ground balls, and no walks. Like I kind of, we talk about guys that don't going to blow up. Like that's kind of a profile for me. But like maybe he won't be great, but he's not going to blow up either. It's just hard for him to blow up. But got to limit the home runs. And that's the one thing. But a guy who gives up that many ground balls, you know, I hope the home runs can come down. Um, I really like Whitlock's profile of, the, of this group, and he goes uh, – I guess he probably goes before Hauk does, but uh, he's a guy for me around 16, 17, 18, you, maybe even a little bit later as, as you get into some of these as people drafting hitters, but uh, he's someone I'm, I'm really interested in. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a, that's a really um, a good shout-out. Just looking at my at – my, uh, what I have, I have Bayo as 305th ranked and going at – at uh, 218 has been his ADP in the main event. So well, we, learned, gonna... we learned, we learned very quickly as you went through Bayo that you are, uh, you are not high on him and not drafting him. So that's, uh, that's the one, uh, one tip everybody knows about you and about your drafts coming up. Yeah, for sure. I'm not getting, I'm not dry, drafting Brian Bayo and I'm not <laughs> drafting Juan Soto. All right, people. Well, actually that's, that's not true. My main event, I'm not drafting Juan Soto because I have him in my first two CL cubes. So oh, okay. I'm, I, I do, I, yeah, that was so you. You like one, so you're just not going three for three with. Him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to go three for three and put my entire season on. When are uh, I know you said you weren't you weren't drafting a main in Vegas. When are you drafting your main? Uh, I'm actually going to be in Vegas. It'll be Sunday night, but it's an it's an online one. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, I'll, and I'll what be you're doing? doing uh, you doing a, what? What? What are you doing? You're you're doing uh, uh, some auctions there then? Yeah, I'm doing a um, uh, bunch of auctions. I'm doing Friday morning um, auction championship. Uh, Saturday um, evening auction championship um, and then diamond auction Sunday morning oh, followed nice. by um, the main in the evening. So that'll, it'll be a long be, week, but I, I love those live right auctions. Like, I know. I, I have went, not, uh, I have not done a live auction in NBC and uh, I am yeah, this year for uh, the first time. You are. Oh, that's yeah. amazing. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Which one are you, uh, uh, are you doing? Friday, the Austin Championship 1500 on uh, Friday afternoon, the four o'clock. one. Nice. Yeah, yeah. It's so much fun. I mean, honestly, like once I did an auction for the first time, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm really going to limit my, uh, fab leagues or not my fab leagues, my, my snake draft leagues. I love the auction. I love what it presents. I love the yeah. opportunities, the builds, the, 
the dynamic in that live auction room is really incredible. So um, yeah, it's yeah, weird because I only like except for, except for the NFC football, like the the main the prime time. I almost all my football leagues are auctions. I love it. I wouldn't do it any other way because I think it works really well. But uh, I'm looking forward to it. Baseball. They put uh, Steve Weimer and Posma in my league, so uh, oh, yeah, nothing man. like uh, nothing like uh, jumping in the uh, jumping in the shark pool for my first live auction. I've done. I did many auctions. It was my first live one, so it'll be fun. Though I'm looking for, I, I love both those guys, so it'll be fun to, uh, fun to auction with them. Even if they, uh, even if they teach me a couple lessons, I will. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. For sure. What do you, what do you think Whitlock hits in terms of innings this year? Because one of the things is his, he's projected at 345, but that's at, um, that's at I think 75 innings. Um, or something I, like that. Uh, if I, if I, when I'm drafting him, I'm hoping for like the buck 15 to buck 25 somewhere in there. Okay, let's give him 125 and let me just see what that does for him. Yeah. So he goes from he goes from 345 to 270. Yeah. Which is right about where he's going at ADP. Yep. So, you know, looks like a, a if you think he's going to hit there, I think it's a good pick. You know, and, and one of the things too that I like about him like you mentioned before, like he's got solid ratios. Yeah. You know? Like I mean, he struggled a little bit with the whip because of the Babbitt last year, but you know that that's going to come back down if he gets yep. to a higher higher volume. And so Getting that, getting those ratios there is almost an added boon because um, you feel a little bit more confident maybe in that than you do in of other players. Yeah, there's a lot of guys in here where I'm like, yeah, I could see him break out, get some strikeouts, but the ratios are always going to be sketchy and at risk. And I, uh, I love someone down here that I think, uh, if nothing else, you know, not throw a ton of things, but I think I'm going to get good ratios out of him, and I, I do think I'll get that with Whitlock. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Well, Toby, I appreciate uh, appreciate much appreciate you jumping on. And this is a a long endeavor, but really fun. I really enjoy it. I always enjoy talking baseball with you. But I enjoyed uh, kind of breaking through a draft, breaking down a draft with you. It was uh, you have a, a lot of good thoughts. It was really fun to kind of uh, walk through and talk about a bunch of players, some of the strategies. Hopefully, it'll be helpful for people too. Even many been listening to the, on the audio version. I think that does that. We've talked about a lot of kind of just general draft stuff and a lot of players that I think it will provide value there, rather than just doing play by play of the draft. We did some of that too. So. Appreciate you jumping on. Uh, I always like to do at least a couple of podcasts with you during the year uh, when when, uh, when Jeff has me gone. So I'm glad you're able to make it. And uh, anything else on your mind uh, you want to say before we jump out of here? No, Scott, this has been amazing. We yeah, need more fun. live play yeah. by play of you know the stream drafts. I know other people are doing it too, and like it has been a blast. If you ever need somebody to do it, I'm I'm happy to join you. It's uh it's really uh it's really been a lot of fun. So I enjoy it. And thank you to you and Jeff for the podcast that you guys put out. I know it's the, it's one of the industry standards. So appreciate that. Appreciate that. Very nice of you to say too. So I appreciate you jumping on. I look forward to uh, seeing you next week. When do you get in town? Uh, I get into town on Thursday evening. Nice. So I'll be there Thursday evening through, I leave on Monday morning-ish, afternoon-ish. So how about you? How, how, how long are you able to be here this be week? Be there uh, Thursday, kind of midday-ish to Saturday after the main event. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, I hope I get a chance to see you a little bit this time. Uh, hopefully so. Hopefully we'll have a chance to chat a little bit. So I uh, will look forward to that. Uh, again, appreciate you jumping on. Appreciate fan tracks for the sponsorship of the podcast. Appreciate everybody listening. Um, there were a ton of people watching this. Uh, it's an, a bonkers number when I look at how many people were, were paying attention to watching this. Really appreciate it. Hopefully everybody enjoyed it. Hopefully found it valuable. Hopefully everybody found it fun. Uh, appreciate all the comments in the chat. It was pretty much going the whole way through. A lot of uh, a lot of names we recognize, a lot of names we don't recognize too. Always fun to see uh, you know new people in the chat. So appreciate that. Hope everybody has a really good time. Everybody that's going to Vegas, look forward to seeing you next week. Can't wait for that. One of my favorite weekends of the year. Uh, everybody else, we'll be back uh, Sunday night. Jeff and I will be talking a lot of main event uh, teams that we've drafted. A lot of news and notes as the season gets going here. So appreciate everybody listening. Uh, appreciate everybody that. Hope everybody has a really good week. We'll be back at you next Sunday night and take care.